Welcome to the Atheist Experience. We are live. Today is Sunday, April 28th, 2019, unless you're watching this in the future, in which case it's whatever date it is then. Uh, I am joined today by two people I've been anxiously anticipating getting on the show, uh, and, and prior to today, we largely only knew each other online, although you and I had met at once when I was in the UK. So this is the UK edition of the Atheist Experience. For the record, uh, the Atheist Experience is a product of the Atheist Community of Austin, along with eight other programs, building a community, building a network, and you should be down here at some point, like all the people on the other side of the glass who have come from all around the world to watch this show live. Uh, the building is packed to the rafters, if it had rafters, but it doesn't. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to let you guys introduce yourselves so that I don't screw it up. But thank you guys so much for being here. We'll start with you. Well, thank you for having me. This is a literally a dream come true. Uh, when I first started making YouTube videos, because my name is Rationality Rules, in case you don't know, um, I make YouTube videos in which I debunk religious arguments and just pseudoscientific arguments. And when I do so, what I try to do is show the specific fallacies that people are using and then show how they would not accept those fallacies or those fallacious ways of thinking in areas where they're not so emotionally attached and then show that it's not okay for them to do it where they are emotionally attached. Um, when I first started YouTube, uh, the atheist experience was absolutely the first thing I watched. And so to be here is incredibly surreal. So thank you very much for having me. My, 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 my pleasure. Yeah, I'm Cosmic Septic, uh, apparently. <laughs> Uh, That's not going away anytime soon. Uh, my name is Alex O'Connor. I run a YouTube channel called Cosmic Skeptic. Uh, likewise, it's it's absolutely fantastic uh, uh, to be here. Really excited. It's it's a totally. I was on Talk Heathen earlier. Mm -hmm. um, it's a totally different, uh, totally different kind of feeling to to the stuff that I usually get to do. So this is really exciting. But yeah, people want to check out the YouTube channel. Just uh, give it a give it a search and a subscribe. Absolutely. By the way, we're we're gonna pri we're not we always prioritize theist callers on the show, but uh, today the lines are full and almost all of them uh, are theist callers right now. And I'm gonna let them decide where we go. Uh, although I still reserve the right to just you know no 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 you're done and hang up if if that's <laughs> funny. But I can't I can't tell you how excited it is because a couple of years ago somebody told me about Alex's channel and they're like oh you've got to see this guy. And so I went and I watched stuff, and I reached out like almost immediately on Twitter, saying, you know, at some yeah. point it'd be great to to work on something. And it's the kind of thing that you almost think is never going to happen because you guys are in the UK, and I'm stuck in. Uh, well, I'm privileged enough to be living in Austin, Texas. Uh, not <laughs> not stuck. I love it here. Um, but yeah, we. I went to the American Atheist Convention in Cincinnati a week or so ago, a week and a half ago, uh, two weeks ago from this, I guess. I've been on the road so long I don't even know what day it is. And then immediately I drove back from Cincinnati and ended up in Dallas for Faithless Forum yesterday. Unfortunately, I had to leave a little early. Uh, I have a friend of mine that I've spoken about on the show before, and I'm going to keep this fairly short so we can get to calls. But my friend of 26, 27, 28 years and former roommate of 15 years, the atheist who was the reason that when I was finding my way out, I was trying to find a way to convince him uh, that a God exists, he went into the hospital and had some stents put in on Monday. He suffered two heart attacks. And then on Thursday, he texted me to say, hey, I, I had two heart attacks and I'm in ICU and I'm recovering. And we chatted for a little bit while I was uh, driving. And then shortly after that, his sister called and said that he'd had a third heart attack. They had to put an impeller in his heart and put him into a medically induced coma for 48 hours. And then I got a call about 12 hours after that saying that things had taken a turn for the worse and he might not make it through the night. Uh, I'm happy to report that while things are still fairly dire, he's still on a ventilator, they've removed the impeller. Uh, he is still in a coma and uh, we are hoping for the best. We know he's getting the best treatment. We are all fans of science and doctors. And I made a comment at Faithless Forum about how there was just like all over his Facebook wall and everywhere else, uh, it was pray, 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 prayer warriors, pray, pray, pray. And that annoys the crap out of me. But I can say that despite the fact that Sh Sean is w one of my best friends of my entire life and he's an atheist, he would not only not be bothered by the prayer stuff, but he would be appreciative because he understands that this is people in a position of futility just trying to show we care, we, we hope the best for you, and I will... Uh, treat those messages in the same vein. So I'm pulling for you. I hope you get through uh, and recover so that I can spoil Avengers Endgame for you since I know you had tickets and didn't get to see it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we look forward to a recovery there. Uh, we're not going to spend much time on 
bandying about. Pick a call. Where do we go? Uh, looks like it might be fun to start with, with Jason. Sure. Uh, in California, who thinks he can prove that God exists. Jason in California, you are here to run the gauntlet. Uh, because I, I have to say, I'm, we're really pleased that, you're, that you've called in, but I, I'm kind of of the opinion that any theist who makes it through the three of us has probably proven God to the world. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so you're J- Jason. You're on with uh, Matt, Alex, and Stephen, and you think that you can prove God exists. So I will back off. Hello. Hi. Hey. Hi. How you doing? Very well, thank you. Yourself? Right, I'm doing all right. Um, went to church earlier, so doing all right. <laughs> cool, cool. But, uh, Let's hear your argument. Anyways. Okay, so my argument will, uh, would have to... My, my big argument would be uh, origin, if we're speaking in terms of uh, existence of God. Um, origin of the universe. Um, origin of morality or objective morality or or knowledge in general um so so you're but, you're, uh, you're you're arguing for god as the foundation for seemingly everything but we haven't gotten we, we kind of need to get to an argument yeah. or presentation right so the argument would be um i mean of course do you believe that some something came from nothing i i personally I, don't I mean, I, you don't nope. okay so if you don't if you don't believe in something from nothing, what do you think of the the cosmos, uh, or how do you think they originated with no, with no prime mover? So for me personally, if you both don't mind me speaking, go for it. Um, I find that a lot of people are ignorant of what the Big Bang theory actually says, and the idea that it it, it is a absolute beginning for everything is just not what it is. All the Big Bang is describing is a moment in time, not the beginning of everything. You couple that with the right. fact that we've observed that energy cannot be created or destroyed, and the fact that despite the massive advancements we've made, we still know very little about the universe. It leaves me in this position where I personally think that there was never a nothing. There's always been something. I don't know that for sure. It's just that's basically right. I don't know is where I would land on that. So I certainly wouldn't go as far as to say that we know there was a beginning, which I assume you would. Uh, which, curiously, yes. I, I, I just want to make sure we touch base here. I'm also in the position of I don't know. I, I don't know why there's something rather than nothing. And the thing that frustrates me is that people who claim that they do know yeah, I, I think it's well, it's sensible to take a position of agnosticism on on the issue. However, I'd also like to point out that uh, if if you're implicit in in your question is is the idea that something can't come from nothing, uh, that is uh, a claim that can't be justified in the sense that we've never actually had any experience of nothing. There is no nothing in the universe. So people often say things like something can't come from nothing. Like you're not worried that a, that a horse has just appeared in your living room like while while you're out at the shop, but well, your living room isn't nothing. That's that's not what something coming from nothing really means. And the Big Bang is the only instance, if it truly is the beginning, which, as we've said, we don't know that it was. Uh, but if it was, then it is the only instance in which we've truly actually seen uh, this um, something actually coming from what would be genuinely nothing. Everything outside of that, okay. everything after that, let's say, will, will have been uh, not from nothing, but from pre-existing matter. So, so if you're going to appeal to the experience that you have of the universe to say that something can't from, come from nothing, then you're not really understanding what nothing is. Right. So, okay, um, that's a pretty... Well, I'm trying to unpack all of that, but I understand there's three people and I'm, I'm actually very appreciative of all your answers. But the uh, first guy I talked to, he, he mentioned it was a specific amount uh, or a specific time or point in time where the Big Bang took place. Um, time to me is actually a component of the, of the known universe. So uh, it wouldn't be a point in time, but the beginning of time. So do you know why we have that, why many people believe that? Do you know what information that's based on? Uh, excuse me, what, what, what do you know on? why people believe, physicists included, that time began at a certain time? It, well, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. As you well, can no, hear, I but... do. I, I, be, I believe that space-time continuum is exactly what I'm talking about when, I t- when I'm talking about something. Because it's so, based on okay. Einstein's theory of general relativity, and the thing is, yeah, we know it's yeah. wrong. 
what's you know what's wrong we know that general relativity does not work at the big bang it's a bit like how newton's laws don't work when it comes to celestial bodies it doesn't mean that it's useless or anything it just means that our theories break down this is why we were all expressing that we don't know because all of our theories don't work at that point because when you're talking about space time what we really should say is our local presentation of space time which then would not preclude some other sort of time or some other sort of space, whether it be multiverse or whatever. And this is why I think most of us give the answer of, we don't know, uh, we don't have an, you- an explanation for the origin of the universe, but you're here to tell us that you do, and so yeah. we would like to find out what it is and why, why we should believe it. Okay, so uh, you, when you say we don't understand what nothing is, I would believe that. We can't... Uh, Supremely understand that concept because there is something. Well, yeah, but it, it's okay, not just—it's uh, not just not understanding what nothing is. It's not actually having access to it. It, it seems an odd concept to have access to nothing. Well, but it, I, but it, I think you see nothing, what I mean. It, I do, but but it's a so, it's a step in the wrong direction because what you're what you're saying is there was a point in time. That there was nothing, and no, that can't no, be actually, I don't think I've said that. Uh, no, not all three all. of us have pretty much adamantly rejected that entirely. Well, what I heard was that there was a point in time where the Big Bang happened. So you're saying you're 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 presupposing time being being a a prerequisite for for creation when uh, I think many physicists actually know that it is the space time continuum. Or well, the cosmos if, that I am speaking of. How did that begin? If, if it did begin time, at a point of time, that point of time would be zero. It would be yeah. the point at which time began. So it makes sense to talk about it happening right. at a point in time in the sense that as soon as it occurred, time begins, and that beginning of time okay. is the time at which it occurred. But before that happened, but, well, before that isn't even really a concept that makes any sense. Yeah, and before that, we still aren't aware that, that there was ever nothing. So do you uh, yeah. think that there... It's some, I'm, I'm Just for clarity, do you think at some point there was nothing... And there were, ne- and then after that, there was something, and that God is the reason. Well, well no. Uh, when, okay, adhering to the space-time continuum, how we perceive it and understand it. Before that, there was only God. God is. How, it, how do you know that? He's the, only, he's the only uncreated. Well, because we need a creator for creation. <laughs> It, well, you, you only need a creator for creation because you're calling it creation. Exactly. You're smuggling the creator in. I don't need a creator for existence. And I, I want to okay. take you back slightly well, to this idea of something from nothing. Can you give me one example of something coming from nothing? Just one. Yes. Um, Other than what you're trying to prove, one. which is the universe coming from right. nothing. <laughs> Yeah, because that is the only one. So that's the only one you have. Well, that's not even something from nothing. That's something from God, according to your model. Well, absolutely. And God's not nothing, right? Well, God is the only uncreated. Well, I don't care. Is God nothing? He is is beyond physics. He's beyond space-time continuum. That is the point. Yeah, but but look, so is the Big Bang. No, the Big Bang is a very dense... Uh, yeah, and what what happens what happens at a singularity is the laws of, the laws of physics break down. Also, it's not an explosion; it, it's it's more of an expansion. But right. look, the the, okay. the 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 whole one of the most interesting things about the Big Bang is that uh, at the point of singularity, the laws of physics break down. So, if you're going to say that God exists outside of the space time continuum, exactly. I mean, a moment a moment ago, you were you were calling us up for trying to claim that the Big Bang is subject to time because it can't be because it exists outside of that, and then you're saying that well, I'm going to appeal to God because God, God exists no, outside no, God of the, the space time continuum. Well, you're the one who just a moment ago was telling us that the Big Bang exists out of the space-time continuum. So why can we no, uh, allow no, you no, to, to appeal to your God in a way that we can't appeal to the Big Bang? So, again, uh, the Big Bang is the beginning of time. According to whom? So, um, well, most physicists don't believe that you can have an eternal amount of time in the past because we would have never uh, come to now. Physicists an, are an divided. Amount, uh, some physicists believe okay. that time doesn't... There is no effect on time at the Big Bang. I don't understand why we're appealing yeah. to physicists in the first place. You mm. have you have, you right. have a view... Well, because I hang, on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay. You have a right. view that there needs to be some explanation for the origin of reality and that you have that explanation, and I'd like to know what is it, what's the evidence for it, and why should we accept your explanation? Well, it... it, it it requires deduction, and um, 
so I can't come go and show you the evidence. Uh, but if you can deduce, like, you know, it's a lot like uh, the big question, could God create something too heavy uh, for him to lift? No, no, no. You know, if you're, if you're going to, or square circles, if you're going to be talking in terms of, no, I can't, that's, I can't even understand those things. Well, so you, this is what's frustrating is all we've asked is for you to explain what you're convinced of and right. why you're convinced and you're going on about can God yeah. create a burrito so hot that he couldn't eat it type stuff. <laughs> and none of us are presenting that. Yeah, you're saying, like, I can't answer this. Well, you're, you're the only one who's talking about it. You're saying, you're saying I can't talk about this, right. I can't talk about that. Well, well we're not talking no, about that. We, you, you, no, I, I'm joining you in your it, misunderstanding. I, it says, I can't it says on the call screener thing, yeah, I was about it, to say. Says you, it says you can prove God exists. That's all we're wanting you to do. Okay, so let me see here. I can prove... The, the Christian God exists if we can agree. Well, that's even stronger. Because mm. even if, even if yeah, we all accepted that there was some kind of thinking agent mm -hmm. beyond the universe, that doesn't mean it's a Christian God. So now you've stepped up what it is that you think you can prove. So let's get to it. Because right. these guys aren't going to be in the okay. U.S. forever. So, right. Okay. I, and I appreciate I your time. I hope that changes. I truly do. And your patience. Okay. Um, so basically what I'm trying to get at is, to me, it's pretty... It's pretty obvious that uh, there was a beginning in time because you can't have an eternal past of, of moments because there would, you would never get to now. These are things where, I mean, if you were to say you don't know that, that's being impractical and it's not Occam's, you're not going by Occam's razor. Yeah, well, there's a, your position here is, is the statement that you're saying that you know there was a beginning cannot be substantiated. But for the sake of argument, let's say that we agreed. Let's see where your argument goes. Right. Okay. So, if we can agree that there is a prime mover, uh, I would say... What do you well, mean by prime mover? Power. Yeah, that's an extra That's thing. a massively different we're, thing. We're just agreeing that the universe here had, had a beginning. Yeah. Um, had a beginning. Yeah. Like a cre but you need a, something outside of what, physics what, why is to that? create physics. How do you know that? In physics. Yeah, why? Why is that? Yeah. Because um, if there was nothing, the something would have to come from God being outside of the physics. So if physics, if physics, then something outside of physics. So, so we didn't physics. agree to nothing. We agreed to a beginning uh, with, the beginning respect, of, with, of with respect to time. Practice. But now you've taken an extra step by asserting that God is the only explanation for something. How did you rule out universe creating pixies? Um, well, like, you, you know, I've actually, you can't, true knowledge, uh, it, it is faith-based. Okay. There is all hey, knowledge is. I'm gonna I'm gonna pause. Point. I'm gonna pause you once again. Okay. When you say faith based, you, you, are you talking mm -hmm. like Hebrews eleven one faith, or are you just talking about confidence? I'll give you a good example of what I mean by faith. If I wanted to determine whether a guy could speak true Koine Greek or not, and I had five other people that that I had you know credentials for them being able to speak the language, and I went to one of them, uh, one by one, and I asked them to read a paragraph in Koine Greek and translate it into English. And one came up with a completely, you know, wrong idea of what it said, and then the other four had exact matches of what the Koine Greek said. I could deduce then that one of them was and if these were all inter interdependent, independent, you know, none of them had any any, any interaction before time for this. One of them doesn't know Koine Greek, and four of them does. Okay, because it, it's not now. It's we, not. We'd, fact, we'd have to. We'd have to. We'd have to point out that it's possible one of them knows and four don't, and it's possible that all five of them are wrong. But if you're talking about building a statistical model, yes, I would agree. But I don't see where there's faith in there. Yeah, yeah. I'd well, exactly. how could the other four know exactly what the other three said and do the to the T? I'm saying they never had any reaction. So it would be one doesn't know. Well, the other four had no idea of co collaborating, and no way to collaborate. I, I'm saying so that, that what you're talking about is a statistical inference, which I think all of us would agree. Right. You've reached the right, right conclusion, but I don't think any of us see faith in that. Yeah, right. Well, what we I'm just saying have like a exactly definition what, of faith. Yeah. Just just you, a, you, just you, a you, definition. Yeah. Yes, because uh, if we're speaking epistemology here, you can't really know that. There could be, uh, I mean, if you're thinking of eternity and how, you know, chance and, I mean, there's mathematically, I guess, there's a possibility that all four 
you know, got, just made it up and were actually dead on. I guess mathematically, that's a probability. But as far as as being reasonable and and uh, we've already as, agreed that what we're talking, you have a reasonable inference. I what we're trying to get to a reasonable. You, inference. you said well, that's what I'm talking about. Faith. Well, yes. faith is not a reasonable inference. I, I, okay. I, I have so, I have no example. I wanted to know what your definition of faith was, and it just it just seems that you're saying confidence in the face of uncertainty. And with you also talking about epistemology, it seems like what you're saying is that we don't really know anything for sure. Therefore, everything is faith, and that's just not true. But even if even if it were the case, yes, uh, technically speaking, every single. Uh, all knowledge and epistemology and things like induction are based upon some level of faith, according to my definition of faith, which is essentially uh, yes. assumptions without evidence. I'm perfectly happy to accept that, but I'm not here trying to say that I can prove to you that induction is accurate or that epistemology is accurate. And I'm also uh, not probably not in disagreement with you that these things uh, are reliable. And yet you're coming here and saying that actually you can make this claim and you can prove it to be the case. So by yes, just yes. referring to the fact that there are Areas on which we, uh, other areas on which we might base on on uh, assumptions without evidence, that doesn't in any way justify well, doing I, it in this case. Okay, so two plus two equals four. That is based. That is the absolute truth, but it's based on a pre preconditioned uh, reality uh, that's already come from a mind. Well, okay, it's, so, it's not no, true in I base three. From a mind. It's not true in base three, and it doesn't come from a mind. So mathematics is derived from the principles of logic, and then we we overlay on top of that definitions for two and plus and equals and four. Right. And so within right. that context, right. you can say that this is accurate. What we're trying to find out right. here is you're calling in to prove that God exists. We've wandered all over kingdom come. And you've given an example of a reasonable test to figure out if somebody understands Greek or not, and it's it's a statistical likelihood that you you have a good model. Right. How does that apply? So to, how does that apply to your claim that you can prove a God exists? So that's how I can know. As far as I can, as much as like you said, maximally sure. That's as that's as good as I can get. But it's as good, pretty okay. Bad. Stop. You say this is as good as you get. Here's the thing. I don't think anybody in this room would have a problem with using your model of testing people's knowledge of Greek to determine how likely it is that they understand it. What model do you have for God that is remotely analogous to that one? Okay, so basically, um, I, I, as I was saying, you know, with the uh, whole something from nothing thing, there's many, there's many of them, but let's just move on. Okay, so as far as the paradox and of, you know, an eternal past amount of moments and time beginning somewhere, at least having some point in time, which is what I meant by having... Every word, reader. every word that just escaped your mouth is not remotely analogous to knowing whether or not somebody understands Greek these are issues for which we don't necessarily have solutions or agreements or expertise. Right, so that, 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 that example was only to um, extend an understanding of, of what I mean by knowledge or faith. Well, it doesn't uh, do it, and the, the easiest way to do that is to being, just give being, a definition, just okay. define it. I mean, I define faith being, as... I being define maximally faith. sure of something based on de deductive uh, reasoning and evidence. Except that, that what you presented so, wasn't deductive, it's an inference. Infer inference, yes. Well, it's also de deducible um, <laughs> based on the the process of deduction. So there's induction, deductive. deduction, okay. and abduction. So and you are farther away from deduction and closer yeah, to the other. What, what do you think? What do you think deduction okay. is? Well, deduction is is process of deducing. <laughs> uh, well, uh, you, so. you are correct. You're, you're, sir. Not, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. Um, <laughs> Uh, like w w when we use, w when we talk in terms of things like deductive reasoning, I mean, what, what does that the mean? The project of reasoning, reasoning, yeah. Dedu deductive but, but reasoning. Deductive reasoning. Like, what, what does that, what does that mean? As, as opposed to other kind based of evidence. Based on evidence. So, so. And that, that's exactly. That, no. Not, not, not really. Uh, so, yeah. so de deduction is, is just one type of evidence. So deduction isn't evidence by definition. There's deductive evidence. There are other types of evidence, such as inductive evidence. Um, that's right. the, the words are, are like anathema to each other. The 
deduction is, is a process of logical validity. It's essentially the creation of tautologies. If something deductively follows from another thing, it means that... Uh, so, so if you have like an argument with two premises and a conclusion, if it's a, de a deductive argument and a valid one, then what that means is that if both the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. That's what it means. It's not a, it's not a case of evidential reasoning. It's a case of logical consistency. You create a tautology. The premises essentially yeah, say the same thing as the conclusion. But okay, and, so and, that, and that's not and that's not, not the same. And that's not what we're doing here. When you with so the Sherlock, kind, with the kind of, Holmes is, is famous for deducing. He Sherlock no, Holmes no, he's, he's no. Not. doesn't exist, and he's not famous and, for deducing and, anything. Yeah, he, he actually doesn't use deduction at all. That's yeah. a, that's a complete like. And I know I like I I understand why because a lot of people think that he uh, that he does so because of that quote. I just, I just, that's by, by the way, on. by the way, I'll sidetrack here for something that's actually a part of my magic show, and that is Sherlock Holmes was written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who fancied himself an rather intelligent individual who famously had Sherlock say that when you've eliminated all other possibilities, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the correct answer. And I call this Doyle's fallacy, because how do you know that you've eliminated all other possibilities? This is an exercise in monumental arrogance where he yes, is in, where he is inferring something. And as a friend of Houdini, when Houdini would escape from chains and ropes and the chains and ropes were still bound, Doyle, in his infinite wisdom, would deduce, ah, that's his word, he would infer that Houdini had the ability to dematerialize. He also famously fell for the Cottingley fairies. So I'm not impressed by Sherlock Holmes or Doyle, but I can tell you that neither of them were doing deduction, as Alex has already pointed out. Okay. Well, I, I agree aside. with you, actually, on, on all of that, what you said. But from what I understand, it's the logical process of prediction based on uh, evidence or uh, not, not so much anecdote as inference so that's that's just you know, my understanding put, put i mean inference and deduction aside what you what you've done is yeah. you gave an analogy where you were basically showing a, a, bit, a bit of epistemology you were showing that this is good enough reason or you may describe right. it as faith it seemed you were going as down good enough as any yeah yeah mm -hmm. but but what yeah. we accept the the analogy that you gave what we're interested in is how that is analogous to your position in believing in a god because you haven't given us that no. So, so at the moment, so then, it's, it's okay. a false analogy. Yeah, did you put five gods right. together and test them to see what their capabilities were, <laughs> and four of them got it right, because then you'd have a, you know, you'd be on par. Well, what's the standard for right? Again, it would be God himself. So, Ooh. well, see now, That's now you now you've completely poisoned this to the point where I don't know how seriously we can take anything you say because if you begin with the assumption that there is a God and God is perfect and God is right, then from that you're you can't be shown to be wrong. So you've set up an unfalsifiable proposition. Yeah, even well, no, no, no. Even no, if you I think it's important, I won't argue from a personal experience. Or I revelation. didn't say you That's were. Not what you're doing, but look, if if you like. Uh, if you want to have the view that God is the basis of all truth, then, then you can have that view. But if the very thing that you're trying to prove is the existence of this God, then you at least have to take yourself away from that and detach yourself for, for at least the purposes of argument and in order to get to that conclusion. Right. If you're starting right. and, and, with an and answer I won't... and then trying to find a way to prove it, it also shows that you're not really approaching this objectively. That's not how well, science I, I is done. To, I used to not believe in God, if that's a good place to start. It took a lot of uh, research and... Sure. Then tell us uh, what convinced you. Yeah. Then tell us what convinced and you. Then I'm, Why are okay. you a theist? So, and, I'm, and I am sorry, I don't mean to. This is drawn out. It's a very drawn out process. It's very... It's the deepest question. It might be I that the best of. thing you could do is, after we're done, sit down mm -hmm. and construct an actual syllogism that somebody could analyze to make sure that yeah. you, you're not engaged in a fallacy. But you said you could prove God. I understand that. You said you could prove God. So, yeah, at, so one time, at one I'm time, at one, at one time, you didn't believe, and now you do. We yeah. would like to know. I'm getting three different we, definitions of, of, of single words. You know, that, that might be why it's a little drawn out. I not could write from us, you not. I could write something and you could read it pretty quickly. But if we're to understand each other, there's going to be a little bit of back and forth. But let's say... There's like been said, a lot. We just want to know yeah. why you believe and why you think we, other we people just want you to, We just want you to walk us, walk us through the process that you went through that yeah, convinced you that, that God existed. Right. So basically, what I did after deducing uh, those many things that I, we have been talking about, for such as... Uh, a creator and time oh, and uh, uh, creation happening, and then of you're course, describing the process. Objective. Yeah, you just like I'm right. saying. And how so, did you get to? How did you get to to believing in a creator? And you said, well, once I deduce things like a creator, like well, of course, then you're going to believe in a creator. What we're interested in is how you deduce that. How did you get the creator? Yeah. 
because I'm talking, I mean, like I said, I think when you guys talk about how do we know there was a, a nothing before time and every and physics as we understand it, um, how do I know that? I don't know that. I'm assuming that based on the evidence that I have. So as far as I can know it, it well, I know it. It seems that you, this is why it's a false analogy. You're just making the assumption that God exists. I'm not seeing anything else here. If I'm wrong, the tell me. But if you, if you assume God exists... Okay, so, okay. so we already assumed that, that we had that, that we had a beginning in time. We can't have a past, an infinite past. But let's say we do have a beginning at time. Now. Let's not go over that again, but let's yes, say there's a beginning of time. Right, let's we say there's a beginning of time. Why, why, are you calling it, why are you saying there's a God that must be involved? Where, why are you saying it's conscious? Where are you getting all of these attributes? So I'm sure... Okay, so a beginning requires a beginner... So, so it requires a cause. So you're looking for a first cause. Okay, so let's say that you have a first cause. Let's say that we grant that tentatively. Why, why are you calling okay. that God? Where's the consciousness? Where's the caring for anything? Well, it's the cosmological argument. Um, uh, no, no, it's not. I'll give you a dollar if you can actually word for word present the Kalam cosmological <laughs> argument right now. Give it a go. Okay, what if, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Uh, number two would be the universe began to exist. And the third premise would be the universe has a cause. Okay. Oh, actually, that's the conclusion. But I'll give you the dollar anyway. You can email because that's pretty close to on the money. But let's say that we accept that. All we've shown is that the universe had a cause. Or even that the universe had a first cause. You cannot assume okay. any other attribute that really does go traditionally towards a god. Why do you think it's conscious? Well, from that conclusion... Uh, no, seriously, it, why, do, why do you just, think the cause is conscious? What reason do you have for that? Analysis, based on what? Based on ontological analysis... G give it to me. ...the universe has a cause. Okay, let, let's, hear, let's yeah. hear the ontological analysis then. That would be the universe has a cause. And if the universe Ooh. has a cause, then an uncaused creator of the universe who, who is without the universe or stands... The universe. No, no, no. Beginning why is, why is it conscious? Without time. Yeah. Stephen's specifically asking why it's conscious. For example, even if we were to all accept, for the sake of argument, that the universe had a cause, w w there, there's very little, if anything, we can know about the cause other than it must be necessary and sufficient. But that might also apply to a multiverse or countless other things that we don't know anything about. And yet you've concluded that not only do you know characteristics about this cause, but that you've narrowed it down to it must be a thinking agent that you identify as God, and in your case, specifically the Christian God. And all he asked was, what makes you think the cause is conscious? Okay, that would be how, how I deduce that or determine that, come to that uh, conclusion, would be because he decided it was a time. How do you know that there happened. was a decision? See, you are in, you, you, you're, you're just assuming things. So, so here's, here's an example, okay? Um, when you see a raindrop on the floor, the cause of that raindrop is a cloud. But we know the cloud's not conscious. We don't make such an assumption. So why are you making the assumption of consciousness? Yeah, the cloud didn't need to decide to drop the raindrop. No decision okay. made. It's, okay. just, it's just cause. Would, I guess from the, from the vastness and, and, uh, of the, the cosmos, that's why we refer to it as the cosmos if you're going to start talking about uh, multiple <laughs> universes, which I would still say it is just one. If you're going to say there's multiple in it... I well, I'm sure you'll get a Nobel Prize for that, but let's stop diverting yeah, off no, of no, this. Nobody's saying these things. Nobody's saying these things. One yourself. creation. One creation. It is created because... Or moved. It is, if it is the beginning, it takes something outside of, of physics and time to begin it. Because okay. time... I, the I'm beginning granting of all of this. I'm yes, and that doesn't in any way preclude a multiverse. It doesn't necessarily lead well, or re require consciousness. And by the way, even if there was a conscious creator that happened to, to be the first cause, you have no reason to think that that conscious creator continues to exist. That it may have okay. in, a, in a grand... Okay. But, but the, the question still remains as to how you determined it was conscious. Yeah, we, we've granted a so lot he would, here, okay? And so he really, I'm not... Outside of time. Okay, and, but... Uh, every, so there's a give cause. us an example of a consciousness outside of space and time. Well, he obviously created our consciousness. Well, no, no, no. Give us well. an example of a consciousness. Before you can appeal to a consciousness outside of space and time, you would need to have some kind of example of this, right? Correct. He would, he would not be able to 
the, the creator of time would not be able to be bound by it. Yeah, so, so look, let me, uh, let me try this from a different angle. Um, you say that whatever created the universe must be outside of, outside of time, let's say. And, and previously, you, you were hinting at an argument that uh, essentially the, the reason why yeah. a, a lot of people will say that whatever created the universe, if there was a creator, needs to have been conscious is because it needs to make this decision. And the reason it needs to make a decision is because if there is truly a, a, an infinite amount of nothing, for that to become something by some cause, there has to be some reason why the cause chose at a specific time to allow that thing to come into existence. That's what you're talking about, a decision. And, and he uh, didn't He didn't choose a time because that is your understanding. No, but this, uh, in a, this, this is in the problem. Time, right? This is the problem. So if, if a decision time. is a point in time at which someone changes the switch and, and turns the universe on, let's say, that's what the cause essentially does. Well, if time doesn't exist outside of the universe, then the concept of this, this concept of decision making doesn't exist either. Well, what it is, is that time is sequence. And that's all time is. It's just... Yeah, so if there's no sequence before this, before the before this happens. I, so I'm the fine. sequence began... I'm going to help you out, Jason. Action. I'm going to help you out, Jason. Okay. I am, fine with, I, I am fine with analogies that talk about a local presentation of time in much the way that if I have a Sims game running on my computer, there is a time component to that, and I'm in a completely different type of time than my sims are. I can speed it up, slow it down, pause it, etc. And as someone who can interact there and make decisions, I can work within their time or within my time. So we have our local presentation of time that we experience. And if you are, right. if you are trying to say that God exists in some meta time for us, I'm fine with that as a model. I just don't know what it is that convinces you that your model is accurate. Absolutely. So, uh, and then of course, consciousness would have to be because of the things created in consciousness, or let's, for your sake, I will say the things that, that exist within the, the universe have actually have a consciousness. I would so say what? that would the be things, things in the wow. universe are radioactive. Does that mean God is radioactive? No, that means he created radioactivity. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations. Okay. So I would me... say that he, he, uh, okay. I know you're saying. I know it's it's rough for us to, to, but I truly am trying to find a, a ground. Before, can I just, I can I just ask that. a question just on what you've just said? I'm just interested, and, and you may answer this in a way that requires no further elaboration. But do you think that God created evil? Absolutely. Okay, that that's fine. Then I just wanted to go ahead. <laughs> you don't want to take that anywhere. No, well, I mean, so uh, there are a multitude of problems with, with this, but it's it's a wholly separate issue. I'm happy to go into it, but I, I, I don't if, I don't want to I don't want to digress. But um, to stop the digression, let's go back to that point. We know that some causes are caused by conscious agents, such as if I move my hand from left to right. And we know that there's mm -hmm. more, there's infinitely more, it seems, causes which are caused by things that are not conscious. So let's say that we're, we are assuming for you that the universe had a beginning. To me, it doesn't, but we are assuming this for you to see where your reasoning is coming from. Why are awesome. you saying that it must be conscious? Because, well, because you need to bridge within that. its creation lies consciousness. You, you, that's, so consciousness you couldn't be more circular. Physics. I'm asking yeah. you, why is, why are you assuming that the beginning of the universe must have a conscious creator? And you're saying because it must so have a conscious creator. If I could creator. create a machine, if I could create a machine, is what you're saying, that could do something I that I wanted machine. it to do, would it be me for, uh, creating movement in a machine just because because it can move this, this um, is no. another disanalogy I, it, it's wow. not this isn't this isn't this isn't the same situation I don't, I don't know how i can make this clearer okay so you you i'm sure you understand that there's many causes some causes are caused by agents which is to say by people let's say although agent right. fits a wider definition and most causes are not caused by people. They're not caused by conscious agents whatsoever. It's just like physics, you see, like, like the water falling from the cloud, right? So, you yes. know, both versions right. of those causes exist. Why are you assuming yes. that the cause of the universe must be a conscious one? Because, uh, because he, what? Okay, so if he created the universe... No, no, you can't say he yet. Consciousness. You can't say he, you're smuggling well, okay. it in. But wait a minute, I thought we... <laughs> I thought you gave me that, man. No, I'm not giving you that. I'm not giving you the We're not giving you gender on your creator either, <laughs> just so you know. Oh, gosh. Okay, by the way, God doesn't have a gender. We refer to him as well, a... Then why why did you refer to him as a penis? penis? 
the, but so here's the thing: yeah, all, all, you know, all we've asked okay. repeatedly for a while now, and and I, I'm going to cut the call off soon. Is okay. What reason do you have for saying that the cause of the universe must be conscious? Okay. Again, um, if he created uh, the universe oh and consciousness God. is is my in friend, the universe, you, you can't say no, no, let him finish. Let him finish. If he created the universe and consciousness is in the universe, he must have been conscious, he right? Created so you're looking at a property that exists within the universe and you're asserting that it could not have come about by anything other than a conscious creator, correct? Uh, as far as, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of the... Uh, it's a simple you know, question. If you put, if you put um, uh, all the parts of a truck in a cement mixer, would a truck come out? I guess mathematically it's possible. That's not, what I, that's not even in the same fucking ballpark of what I'm asking. <laughs> You are okay. saying that because consciousness, because there are conscious beings in the universe, that therefore right. the creator of the universe must have been consciousness. Is that what you were saying? I'm pretty sure that it would take a more advanced uh, thing, Man, to creator, to create. I don't know. I, I don't know why this is so difficult to, add, to to get. Because as Stephen was pointing out, there are there are conscious actors, agents that are causes, and right. there are there are non agent causes, and. All we're asking is how you determined that the universe was not caused by a non-agent okay, so cause. Hang on. We're asking how you determined that, how you excluded a non-agent cause, and your answer is because there's consciousness in the universe. And for that, I'm asking, are you saying that if there's a universe with consciousness in there, it must have been created by a conscious being and not had an unconscious cause? Correct. If, if we've already, if you've already uh, given me you know, the whole creator thing. and you know, We would, never no, gave you the whole no, creator no, thing. No, no. I'm going to put you on hold or, so somebody can get the contact information for where to send my dollar, but we're going on to other callers. And uh, thank you for your time. Um, Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank where, you. where do we go next? Oh, well, uh, I, it's up to you. Let's Ooh, take a look. There are um, so many wonderful things to look at. Um, hmm. You know what? Let's take the uh, abortion pro-life Ooh. versus pro-choice. Cool in Canada. You're on with Matt, Alex, and Stephen. How are you? Oh my gosh, it took me. Yeah, you need to you need to turn down and off whatever you're listening to. Hey guys, we're gonna get an echo. How's it going? Okay, cool. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Yep. There's like a delay. There's a long delay, I hear. If you listen to... The, are you on, on a, a computer or are you on a phone? Yeah, I'm on a computer. Is there a delay when you're listening through your headphones to us? I can hear my voice. And you can't hear us? It's a computer. Okay. I, I, apologize that, I apologize that it's... Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a delay. This is not working. I'm going to put you back on hold and we'll, we'll go to somebody else. Uh, Sorry, we'll ho we'll hope to get you back and have somebody walk you through the tech on that. Uh, where else? Uh, so, uh, why we could we could take this one? Yeah. All right, let's take uh, let's take Robin New York. Robin New York, you're on the air. Oh my gosh! Hello, my fellow apes. Hey, <laughs> hello, Good afternoon. Friend. Hello. Oh my gosh! You okay, may be the cool. only um, non-theist caller we take all day, so soak that in. Wow. Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I I might be asking um, kind of from a theistic, <clears throat> kind of from a theistic perspective. Uh, when I, you know, I I didn't really start. Uh, I was raised Jewish, but I didn't really start divulging, you know, into like watching YouTube videos and stuff uh, till recently. <clears throat> so I'm. Uh, how do I ask this quickly? Um, so, okay, outside looking in, I would have thought that the atheist community believed more in free will and that religious people were more, uh, you know, believed more in fate, more in destiny. So I guess my, I, I, I would just really like Cosmic Skeptic and Rationality Rules. I didn't actually find you guys until like a few months ago, if I'm being honest. Um, and I've watched some of your videos on free will, but I, I'm just, can you clarify what, what you mean by there is no free will. I think you both have said that there's, uh, I guess you would say, kind of like more of a simplistic free will, the ability the ability to have done something differently. But ah. do you not believe in free will because we're 
we're biological organisms that are predetermined based on genetics and other factors. I, I, I'm, I think you... Let, let me, let me tee this up for you and let them answer. Uh, libertarian free will, the notion that if we re rerun the clock, we could have done otherwise. Do either of you accept that that is the case? No, absolutely not. And you're both convinced that that's pretty much certainly not the case. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd make the affirmative, the affirmative case that it does not exist. If that's how we're defining free will, and I think that's the, the way that makes the most sense to define free will. Bear in mind, not everybody agrees with me on that. And I would just add, it's the, what we, I experience the illusion that I have that, which is why I would say that is what people mean by free will, at least most of the time. So, so yeah, I think it's just not the case. It's an illusion. And, and I've, been, a, a, I've yeah. been in the past a, a compatibilist a la Dan Dennett, although Stephen and I had a conversation in which mm -hmm. I'm pretty much on board with stating that I have a will, how free it is, I don't know. I think there are definitions of free will that are useful and applicable, but I don't think it's, I don't think they match what most people think of when they think of free will. I do think that they offer an account that addresses what most people care about, which is holding an agent responsible for their actions and stuff. Yeah, but I, I think I think that's where I might disagree yeah. with you. But uh, I, I'm interested in in uh, what you think, Rob. Uh, do you believe in this? If we if we define free will in the libertarian sense of being able to have acted differently, do you believe that that's a, a power that you possess? I do. I do. Uh, I this is. I guess this is why I wanted to know like where. Maybe not the, maybe the way to word it is not where you draw the line, but I, I guess I'm still confused about why you guys know a good way to address isn't free will. Because again, I just just real quick, I, again, I understand whether you believe or not believing in it. Like, I, you know, I understand the definition of being able to have acted differently, but is it? Yeah, again, the, I don't know how else the to reason say, I ask it because we're biological organisms. Yeah, the, the reason I ask is because let's consider for a moment what it would entail for, for this uh, to actually exist. If you were a actually able to have acted differently, what it would mean is that if we uh, were to move back in time and have it such that every single atom in the universe is exactly as it was at that point, including all of the atoms that make up your own neurology. So every single atom in your brain is moving in the same direction at the same speed, doing exactly the same thing, and your synapses are firing in exactly the same way, and your desires are precisely the same, and your motivation to act upon your desires are exactly the same, that somehow, somewhere in that concoction of, of, of events inside of your psychology, something could have gone differently. See, I understand why it wouldn't make sense to believe this, but I really do feel like I, I really do feel like, uh, yes, there are instances where I have been Maybe we can completely indifferent it. In a, and I could have. Yeah, go ahead. I, I, no, no, it's okay. Um, tell me why you think you have free will. What's the reason? Like, give me an instance of where you've actually, you feel I, like you've had, um, and there is an instance of where you've, you've exercised free will. Yeah, examples help give, with Give this. us an example, and we can tell you why we well, would say see, that's I not. Do, yeah, but see, I believe it in a simple sense. I mean, I, okay, here's, here's how, when I was younger and growing up, I thought of free will. Essentially the opposite of fate, the opposite of destiny, you know, the, the ability to make those decisions. Yes. But I, uh, again, so, I understand where you guys. I, I think I can explain yeah. why you have that impression. Um, none of us, none of us here are convinced that you could have done otherwise. But one of the reasons that it's such an appealing thought is quite often we wish we could have done otherwise, and we look back on the past with the benefit of current knowledge. And what we're really often saying is, oh, if I had known then what I know now, but then that would fundamentally change the situation. If, in fact, you rerun the clock, you would not have that information that you have now. But if you rerun the clock and inject it into your, into your mind, the information you have now, you may well have made another decision, but those are not the same things. Something I'd like to yeah, add to that as well, if yeah. you wouldn't mind, is uh, not having free will is not the same same as saying that um, determinism in the in the Newtonian sense is correct, because if your will is determined by this this clock system, if you will, yes, you don't have free will and fate exists. But even if fate didn't exist, which it probably doesn't, and there is some kind of quantum situation where things are happening randomly, 
but still doesn't give you free will because then your 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 actions are either predicated on a clockwork mechanism or randomness. Yeah, you, neither of yeah. those. You've actually got a perfect. Oh man, you're getting past my intelligence level with that last one there, man. You, you've essentially you've got you've got a perfect dichotomy. You've got two options that you can choose from, and 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 it has to be one of the two of them. There's a, there's a law of logic which states that mm. it has to be the case that either p is true, p being a proposition is true, or it is not true, mm. uh, and. It's either the case that the universe is determined, and what we mean by that is that every single thing that occurs in the universe follows a chain of causation. So when I do anything, that's caused by something perhaps happening in my brain, and that's caused by something yeah. else in my brain, but maybe that's caused by something that I saw, so that's external to the brain, and the thing that I saw is caused by something else, and you can trace it all the way back to the beginning of the universe. If that's the case... Yeah then everything's kind of running on a train track of causation and you don't have any control over it because everything that you do is subject to the causation that happened before you existed. That's one option, is determinism. The only other option, because it's either the case that that is true or it's not true, so the only other option is that the universe is indeterministic. And if it's indeterministic, that means that at some point when there's some kind of causal chain, somewhere in there, there has to be an element of randomness. That randomness could exist outside of your brain or inside of your brain, but either way, randomness, by definition, you don't have control over. So the universe is either deterministic, in which case you don't have any control because you're following a a blind chain of causation, or it's random, in which case, by definition, you don't have control over it either. That was a fantastic answer, really. I mean, it's mind blowing. It's, hard, it's that's why it's. I don't. I'm, I'm torn in all directions when I'm thinking of of. Uh, yeah, it's fine. You can't help it. Of free will, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you can. Oh, but it's all right. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. I, you know, that was that was great. Yep. Thanks. Problem. Yeah. Thanks, William. For the record, thank you, we're all pretty much on the same page on that one. Uh, and I don't think there's any substantial disagreement at that point. As a matter of fact, it reminds me of, like, there was an episode of The Nonprofits where we sat down and we all argued for, like, three and a half hours. And at the end, we went out to dinner. And, of course, we all agree on what we do and don't have. We just disagreed on what to call it. Yeah. And th this is probably where compatibilism, the notion that free will and determinism are, are compatible, coming from Dennett, uh, comes under fire so often. Uh, because I don't think he's saying what some people think he's saying. He oh, and, and the common objection is, well, you're redefining free will. Yes, and he would acknowledge, I'm redefining free will. I think it's consistent with what people are looking for, which is we want to we want a way to say that this agent is the one who took this action, uh, and we need to hold that agent accountable, and that there are things that we can do, both because we are reflective agents and able to consider consequences of our action that give us this illusion that perhaps we could have done different or when really what we might often mean is that we wish we'd have done different or we should have done Yeah, different. but interestingly, like, the, the reason why compatibilism falls flat for me is because it does have to make this redefinition. And once that redefinition occurs, the reason it's called compatibilism, after all, is because it's trying to make compatible determinism and free will. Mm. But if you redefine free will in such a way that it doesn't require that compatibilism because you don't need the libertarian aspect, then all you're left with is determinism. So you may as well just call yourself a determinist. But I would say as well that um, the compatibilism... Of the redefining, which I wouldn't do because I think it's not helpful, but the position itself, if we call it will or we call it whatever, it's really useful because there is a distinction to be made where there's agents. Yeah. So it's well, like when me and you had our conversation. We're not was, rocks. Yeah, yeah we're yeah, not rocks, you, you, and that matters. I would I would even disagree with that. This mm. is where I'd, I'd take an even more hardline stance. But you're a rock, you. so why should we listen to you? Look, <laughs> the, 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 fact, the fact of the matter is, everything, every every part of my psychological state that, that exists right now, the, the chain of causation that caused that to occur, does trace back to inanimate matter, and that's, that's the point. So, the only thing the compatibilist can actually do is make an arbitrary distinction between whether a chain of causation exists entirely inside of the brain, or whether it... Uh, pers sort of comes from outside of the brain and the, 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 like, the, the likelihood is that most all of them actually originate uh, if you go far, far back enough outside uh, of the brain and so if you're a determinist and compatibilism by the way like requires determinism so you don't, you don't have this element of randomness um, if you're a compatibilist you believe that determinism is true which means that you believe that every single atom in the universe is in, on these train tracks of causation if that's the case then your psychological state is completely determined by things over which you had no control. To me, that, that's not making anything compatible. Like, the, the distinction between whether that chain of causation is thought about as existing entirely inside the brain, which, by the way, it's, it's not, 
is, is arbitrary to me. I, I don't see why why it should matter. Yeah, I'm in agreement with the with the facts. And by the way, he's definitely not arguing for compatibilism. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, the di the distinction is, is in this area of self reflect self reflection, the ability of agents to learn, not so that we could redo what we did in the past, but so that we could change the sorts of behavior we have in the future. And I would also agree that we have no control over that either. That yep. that, that is essentially illusion. And yet we recognize that there are some agents who have, for example, flawed reasoning, which can be corrected by uh, education from agents whose reasoning is not flawed. And this is why I don't take all that much credit for anything I've ever done or thought or anything else. Because, yeah. uh, you know, you get, get into conversations about privilege. I, I, I'm, if, if anything, I'm privileged that I have a brain that seems to function reasonably uh, most of the time or at least be open to correction when it's not. Yeah, but that's why I think it's important to, to really focus on what we do think is... is what You say, like... Uh, it depends on what you think is important when it comes to defining free will. And for me, when you have a situation where uh, the, the free will argument that we're essentially making removes the ability for, pra uh, for praise and blame, essentially, because like you say, like you can't really take credit for the things that you do. To me, that's part of the, the importance that people are looking for when it comes to free will. The reason why they're reluctant to accept that it doesn't exist is because of the fact that you have to do away with concepts of praise and blame. Have you read much on rules and his concept of entitlement? Tell me. Where well, entitlement is the idea that you don't... Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Go, go ahead. Okay, well, I, I'll put it succinctly. Entitled, entitled, <laughs> the way that rules looks at things is that you don't deserve anything that you have. You're just entitled to them. And what he means by that is when you trace it all back, you didn't choose to be born with the IQ that you have, the biology that you've received. It's, you, it's not something that you earn by not being born with leprosy and in the third world or whatever it is. So you don't really deserve a lot of the fruit that you are able to bore, but you're entitled to most of them. I think this definition of will is actually quite useful when it's in when when we make it compatible with this idea of entitlement. I think that there needs to be a distinction made between the rock and agents, and that, that we need to do that with something useful. I don't think it should be called free will because we all we, we still have the persistent feeling there's, there's that we're free. Yeah, I would call it will, but um, I, I'm not I sure I like the difference. I'm not sure I like the notion of entitlement, but I am fine with the notion that there's not praise or blame, and yet still this is the agent who is responsible right. for the for this action because this is the there's like levels at which you can hold something responsible. If I have a tumor in my brain that is causing me to act out, and the tumor is removed, clearly I'm no longer a problem, and we can put the blame or the responsibility on the tumor, and I, as an agent, have now fundamentally changed. But, but in, interestingly, that that's... Look, if if you had a situation where uh, a friend of yours who, who had been uh, just a perfect friend for, for all of your life all of a sudden goes and, and commits a horrendous genocide or something or, or kills a family or something, and you're just bemused by this, and he gets taken to the, to, into custody, starts complaining of a headache, and it turns out there's a brain tumor pressing against the part of his, his brain that deals sure. with rational thought, your moral evaluation of that person would, would almost disappear. And, and in fact, you probably wouldn't think of the agent as being responsible for that right. behavior. But here's the thing. The reason why you wouldn't consider that agent uh, responsible there is because the only reason they acted in that way was due to some process that happened inside of their brain over which they had no control. Well, that's the case with every single conscious action we ever make. The distinction, though, is that you have removed that cause. And this is something that you can you can kind of discreet, discreetly detect is that mm. this was the proximate cause for this, and the person is now no longer affected by that. Yeah. When it's just flawed thinking, where we have bad ideas in there, you can't ever be as confident that you've removed them or that the person's changed, which is why we hope people can change right. even whether but, they. But do. you know, spe speaking in principle, like that. If, if we had the practical ability to, I could scan your brain and find out why it is that you want to act in a certain way, and I could just adapt it. I could go in and, and, mm -hmm. and adapt your neurology. So in the same way that we can get rid of a brain tumor, which is a totally unnatural process to go into someone's brain and remove a part of it, I could do the same thing for something that isn't a tumor, but it's just a functioning part of your brain, and it would have the same effect. This is why I think it's an arbitrary distinction. That's why I called it an arbitrary distinction, because to me there's no difference between the tumor being the part of the brain that's causing you to murder the family and your will being the part of the brain that's causing you to murder the family. The, and to me, the, the difference people. is that we're at a point, like once upon a time, we couldn't have done anything about a tumor. And so we would have had no choice but to consider, we wouldn't even have considered a tumor as a, as a contributing factor. Mm -hmm. Now we can. And when we get to the point where we can manipulate people's brains in the way that you're talking about, 
well, where where you can be specific about what you're changing and whatever. Then all of a sudden, I think the perception of that's going to change. It's about what we can do something about but that makes the, the difference. I think that would just essentially lead to the creation of a society of robots. You're essentially suggesting, like, when somebody has has a view or a will uh, that, that it, we don't want them to have, we can just change it. And and it's like... It's, no, it, no, no, no. I'm not going down that... Nowhere near that. I'm talking about when we can do that, not how and why we should do that or what you know whether or not the person gives up their bodily right. autonomy because i could just say no you're not operating my brain no matter what and if you did it anyway yeah. now we've got a potential moral dilemma i'm just talking about at what level at what discrete level do we put responsibility sure and so when we know nothing we put the responsibility at the agent when we know about brain tumors and can do something about it we may put the responsibility there and if we get down to further discrete levels we might just say that you know Matt's brain's completely fucked up, but he won't let us change it. And so now we have no choice but to view the agent as a whole as as defunct. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think you're right that it's important to, you said like will is, is a useful word, um, but let's just not call it free will. It's, it's Schopenhauer said you can do whatever you will, you just can't will what you will. And that's the whole point. And I think that people, when they think about it enough, realize that, that the ability to have some agency over your will is part of the importance of free will. Yeah. But even if it's... Even if it's not the case that the kind of free will that a compatibilist would would put forward is what's meaningful to most people, it doesn't mean that it can't be and we so, can't change the... as much as I'm loving this, I have no choice but to request we get to the next call. Yep, let's Absolutely. do it. Because this is a wonderful Because Stephen has already fixed this. It's just going to take me a while to start to get in the habit of removing the word free before I talk about will. Right, yeah. Where Good do we go now? So have we got have we got him back? Is that what... I, I haven't got any message, so we'll okay, stay off uh, that for now. Sure then. Um, well, it's. I'll, I'll. You go ahead. I think it's your choice. Oh sure. Okay. Well, look. Let's. Uh, oh, I tell you what. That top one looks uh, mighty juicy. Yeah. That, uh, we, we can go to Greg in New York. Greg in New York. Greg in New York. You don't have to keep dialing. You're on the air with. Uh, yeah. Hello. 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 Yeah. Very. Uh, very honored to be on your show. Just Thanks. What have you got for us? Uh, so I'm gonna discuss the empty tomb. See, uh, see uh, if you can answer to this to the it's um the theories that you can provide that can account for this fact. So can we even say that it's a fact? Right. Well, we'll start with the evidence for it. So first off, we'll start off um, with the evidence for the burial, which is that. The, well, just for instance, like Mark fifteen forty two to sixteen eight, um, one one which was the early passion narrative, which actually happened to be early. One Corinthians fifteen three to seven eight, which is also accepted by most scholars to be early, and by Josephus, Jewish war four point three one seven, and this happened to be uninterpolated by Christian sources, and the, and it also agrees that crucified victims received a proper burial, and Jewish law demanded that even foreigners and criminals had to be buried, in Deuteronomy twenty one twenty three, and um, against Appian two point two. Again, also not not interpolated. So we also have archaeological evidence for the burial, such as with Yohanan ben Hagalgo, and the burial account of Jesus also meets the criteria of embarrassment, since they have to admit that they cannot afford their own tomb to bury Jesus. So basically, but you're I, saying that some people, within a short period of time after the events purportedly occurred, correct. Mm -hmm. talk about a burial that is consistent with burials of the time. Right. Sure. Right. So. Do, you, do we want to start off with the fact that Jesus died by crucifixion and this builds on the fact that he was crucified and do, therefore this results in a burial? Do, do, we have, do we have any contemporary extra-biblical evidence for this? We do, actually. So no, we actually we don't. So we Tacitus isn't contemporary, Josephus isn't contemporary, and the Gospels weren't written for decades afterwards. I'm saying outside of the Gospel accounts, outside of what's in the Bible— is there a contemporary account, somebody writing at that time to attest to the facts that the gospel record attests to? It, was, it came from oral tradition. So Tacitus and yeah. Acts 15. And so the answer is no. Oh, may, I fi may I finish? Maybe. I'm just may saying I, that if you acknowledge that it came from oral tradition, I don't deny that at all. But when I ask what the contemporary accounts are, and you acknowledge that we don't have the written contemporary accounts, now we're just basically talking about hearsay and a story that, that has been processed. Here's perhaps an angle that you can consider. You've come into this and the main sources of evidence you've given so far are from the Bible, which you've quoted very eloquently. No, Tacitus, no, Tacitus, okay, so Tacitus, 
in Annals 1544 said that Christ was ex- executed and this was... I know, I, I know, I know, but just, just one second. So you, you're presenting information and many references from one source, and it's the Bible. Now, the way no, I no. look at this is similar to somebody ringing up and saying that they have proof that Spider-Man exists, and their proof that they're offering is that they've read the magazine and they've given several different references to several different pages which reference Spider-Man. No, I so, gave extra biblicals. I gave so extra it's the extra biblical that, that I'm interested. Because but they're not contemporary accounts. Wait, they, I'm, right. they are based We're, on the define same... No, no, define contemporary. Well, considering Tacitus wasn't born until after these events occurred, the best Tacitus could ever do is talk to people who either were eyewitnesses or claimed to have spoken to eyewitnesses. So maybe this was passed down via like two generations via oral tradition, which has which did happen as like people had to people took from for instance from teachers and they could memorize entire texts such as the Iliad or the Odyssey. Yeah, but you're aware that within a, s- a single generation within my lifetime Elvis died and people claimed to see him in convenience stores. Right. So these so these so Contemporary accounts don't necessarily have to be first generation in order to be at least considered to be factually correct within a framework of, within a framework, within a historical framework. I don't, I don't even formal. consider any personal testimony to be a fact. What do you mean, per, but what do you mean by personal testimony? If you We're observe something, it, it's counted as evidence in law, but it's not in science. And, and the question isn't whether or not it should count as evidence, which I'm fine with anecdotal evidence. The question is whether or not it's sufficient evidence and whether we can reasonably conclude yeah. that what you're, what you're claiming is accurate. And so while there may have been a Jesus and he may have been crucified and he may have been buried, um, what we have are stories about this and not actual evidence to support the stories. And so when you cite, when we don't, we don't. And, I, and I'll explain why in just one second. We don't have physical evidence for this. So I, I had a debate with somebody who said... Scientific sa- evidence? You mean scientific evidence, like tangible evidence. Yeah, the evidence that I give a damn about. That's, that's, that's what we don't have. That's not necessarily the only kinds of evidence. There's philosophical evidence. There's I, historical evidence. I, I understand that. But what, as I mentioned a minute ago, what, what matters is whether or not it's sufficient. And so if you're going to be arguing for a single occurrence, supernatural event that violates our understanding of how the universe works, you have to come better than something that was an oral tradition that was passed on and written down and reported by others decades after the fact. So, so you've just... You've just okay, so... Let's back off for a second. Why do you think supernatural events are impossible? I did not say that supernatural no. events are impossible. Or, or I, impossible. No, stop. I did not say that. I said if... I, well, first of all, I have no evidence for any, any, any claim of supernatural causation. I have no evidence that it's ever been accurate. So that's why I would reach the conclusion that it's improbable. But the point, yeah. that, I, but the point that I made had nothing to do with how probable it is. It has to do with what sort of evidence would be required to be reasonably convinced that a supernatural event occurred. Historical evidence. You can't demonstrate the supernatural historically. Okay, we can. We can. I don't understand what you mean by supernatural. This can be discussed in a philosophical context. Like, is the supernatural possible? And I don't see the. Re- and I don't see the reason for why it is not. Sure, it's possible. Yeah, well, that's a shifting of the burden of proof. It's not up to people to demonstrate that the supernatural isn't possible. It's dem- it's up to people who are claiming supernatural to demonstrate that it is possible and right. then to I- go and then to go the extra step to show that it is the most probable explanation for the fact they're trying to explain. Again, I've sh- uh, again, I've shown this historically through the empty tomb. No, no, an empty tomb is not a proof of the supernatural. An empty tomb is con- confirmation of an an empty tomb is confirmation of an empty tomb. So if I make a prediction and it comes true, that's independent of how I was able to make a prediction that came true. Just as an empty tomb, if in fact this is accurate, is independent of the explanation for why the tomb was empty. Okay, but you need to come up with an explanation. No, with an explanation. no, you don't. No, 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 you can't. No, you can't. No, you can't. Here's why. We don't have to, we don't, I'm going to hang up. He's finished. I'm going to hang up. You're, you're saying that we have to come up with an alternate explanation. That is also shifting the burden of proof. Even if I have no alternate explanation, that does not mean that supernatural causation wins by default. That's a fallacy. How is that a fallacy? No, no, it's not a fallacy because we're... I here's, here's, why, stop now. Look, here's why it is. 
Let's say we find a tomb and it's empty, okay? And you assert that the reason that it's empty is because there was some supernatural event. And I say, I don't believe that. It's you, the burden of, of, of proof is on you to substantiate why you hold that extraordinary position and extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Right. That's what we're looking for. Right. So, so now may I finish without being interrupted? <laughs> if you pull some smug shit again, you won't. It's not, it's not smug shit, I'm telling you. Okay. Oh, that is a fact, okay. So I've, come, so I've come with the empty tomb, and the resurrection is so far the only theory that can account for this fact. Why? What why? Why? Well, here's so one. The reason, the reason, okay, I'll tell you why. Aliens yeah, came, aliens came aliens. and took Jesus' body. Here's another one. The Romans aliens. thought it would be funny to just go in there and take the body. Here's another one. It's a story that didn't actually happen. Okay, so, all right, let's 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 start with those theories. So, let's start with the here's first another one. one. A herd of elephants just ran in there and took him away. No, hold on, you, you said let's start with the first one. Like, let's not go through and actually disprove that these are... Our yeah, point is not sure. these are these are alternative explanations that we think are better than yours. The point is that there are more than one explanation, and just by saying that... that, that, that okay, possibility is not probability. That's a fallacy. Possibility does not entail probability. Okay. None of us said that, and I don't think any of us disagree. And uh, it kind of does as well. If it's possible, then, it, then there's an the essence of probability. Non, non-zero probability, but yeah. Yeah. Mm. But your argument shows, your argument has shown that. What, what uh, argument? What are, yeah. Yeah. What, what, uh, actually, in, interestingly, okay, can you just repeat? Because I don't think I've made one, but can you just re- repeat my argument? Okay, so I think one of you said um, that, uh, that Jesus' body was stolen. Right? Well, Am I- you said no, that. No, no, I, yeah, no, no. I just gave you another that's possibility. One, right, that's one possibility. So, the, so the reason I don't, so the reason that possibility doesn't work is because one, it was Passover, and we cannot overlook that fact. And there were pilgrims everywhere, so they would have, so they would have been seen, and they would have been caught. And uh, there's so the, this, this, these are just assumptions. Not if they have making. a teleporter. It's insane. There's all these assumptions you're making, and you're with. Yeah, you, it, it, it seems like it seems it seems frivolous to be just saying you know aliens could have come down and abducted. But the, the point we're trying to make is that right. you can you can give any explanation you like, and just because it, it's not it's not on you to disprove these things. Like you're you're going to go through and try and disprove the the idea that the body was stolen. Like that's not what we're trying to. Do. That's not what we're trying to get you to do. We're trying to make you realize that it's not your job to prove why our theory is wrong. It's our job to prove why our theory is correct. So if I assert that the body was stolen, then I have to justify that claim. Right. And let's say, let's say for the sake of argument, and then I'll let you go, or let you talk, is all three of us are convinced that people didn't steal the body and that aliens didn't steal the body. And so you don't have to disprove any of those. We already agree. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, okay, again, so this is what I'm trying to say is that you're coming up with po- the, those are possibilistic explanations, and I'm only going to argue against the probabilistic explanations. Like you, like the arguments that you think better, better fit the data than the resurrection theory. That no, the better account for the fact. No, than this is the, not what's happening. So we, all three of us, will sit here and say we have no explanation for the empty tomb claim. Now, explain why you're convinced that a supernatural event is the best, most probable explanation. Because it can account because it can account for the empty tomb. Because if Jesus did resurrect, then he would have left it. Then he would have left the tomb and appeared to the disciples. So, so Matt just asked you why you think this hypothesis is likely to be true, and you've just said that it's likely to be true simply because, essentially, because it, it can be true. It's, what do you it's mean? Not good enough. I said Jesus left the tomb and appeared to his disciples. There's, you have not provided a better explanation for. We this. don't need to. We don't, don't need yeah. to. We don't that need is to. the fallacy that I'm talking about. You can view it as either an argument from ignorance fallacy that essentially you're right until you're proved wrong, Mm -hmm. or you can view it as an argument from personal incredulity that you just don't find other explanations satisfying. The point here is not, hey, you're wrong. We're not saying you're wrong. We're saying that you can't present this sort of, or haven't presented the sort of evidence that should convince someone that you're correct. Just because your explanation accounts for other claims, like Jesus appeared to disciples, there's another claim. I want to... The, the, the issue was explain the empty tomb. 
And your answer was that if Jesus was resurrected, that this would explain the empty tomb and these other claims. Well, I haven't even accepted that these other... Sorry? Right, you see, the thing is, the thing is, after I've claimed, and let me finish, please. The thing is, I've said that after I've, I understood the, the resurrection as possibility, we need to find better explanations for this fact. So the conspiracy, no. for instance, that, hold on, hold on, let me finish, that the disciples stole the body, it does not... We're not, not presenting that. It's, it's irrelevant to the discussion. And you keep, you keep repeating this thing, you keep repeating this thing that you've established... You keep repeating that you've established that a resurrection is possible, and therefore the burden of proof is on somebody to show that there's a better explanation. Well, Correct. Once, I've done, once I've done that, this is not an argument from ignorance, Faust. If I just no, no, no. You, first of all, you haven't demonstrated that a resurrection is even possible. You haven't demonstrated even the possibility the of this. Oh my to, God! To show that supernaturality, that supernaturality is false. See, that, that it can't happen. Now you're doing it again by saying that the supernatural is possible until somebody demonstrates it's not. That's not the way this works. This is the shifting of the burden of proof. The, yeah. yeah. You need to understand that we, we're not calling you telling you that we think you're wrong. You're calling us telling us that you think you're right. You're the one who's making the claim. It it's your job. to be on you. I could, if I said to you, if, if I produce a, a Quranic miracle and said, here's my explanation, Let, let's say... Uh, Muhammad splitting the moon in two. And I say, the best explanation I have for that is that Muhammad was the final prophet of God. Do you have a better explanation? It's not your job to tell me a better explanation for Muhammad splitting the moon in two. It's my job to prove firstly that he did split the moon in two, and secondly that the reason he was able to do so was because of uh, some kind of uh, divine connection that he had. This, and this ties exactly to what I was saying. This, hang on, hang on. This ties exactly to what I was explaining before, but you weren't on the phone. So when Sir Arthur Conan Doyle watched Houdini escape from ropes and he comes out and the ropes are still bound, he concluded that the best explanation was that Houdini could dematerialize. Is, okay. Does that explanation stand as the most reasonable conclusion until somebody proves otherwise? Look, the thing is, I'm not saying... That's a question. I'm not saying, this look, 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 what I'm saying is... That's a question. It's a, it's a question and it's not even hard. I'm, I'm, I'm trying... Oh, okay. So yeah. if, if Conan Doyle says that the best explanation is that Houdini dematerialized, does that mean that is the best explanation and is the burden of proof now on people to show that he didn't dematerialize? No, but the thing is, you see... That is that directly I've analogous. a separate fact. I've not just said the resurrection is possible. Therefore, that's a, there's a separate fact. It's the empty tomb. And I'm saying that the resurrection theory is the only so theory... The, the empty tomb. The empty tomb is the ropes that Houdini left behind. Can I please finish? Can, can I not be interrupted? No, you're gone. Bye. I, I, I swear. I, we're, we're, inter okay, let me, let me explain this real quick. We're not interrupting to be rude. I know I do it all the time. There are reasons for this, and there are reasons because if we're in disagreement on a point or a definition and we let it go on and on and on, then we have to come back to it, and then it becomes, oh, that's not what I said or not what I meant. So right, right. This, this is why we have to do this, and I, I presented an analogy, which you agreed to, and we're trying to explain how it's exactly or how it's analogous to the situation you're describing. But basically, you're, you're stepping through premises and we're interrupting you after you've got through your first premise because we don't accept it. And yeah. you may see it as rudeness, but it's actually but I will courtesy. Stop. It's I, I, I will stop. I will stop, Greg. I will stop and I'll let my other two gentlemen here who are far more polite address the rest of this. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let's let so so continue. I mean, so so you like you said we we cut you off. Where were you going? Okay. So what I was saying is that we have a separate we have a separate fact for this, and then we say, well, the resurrection. There's no other theory. The the, the most probabilistic explanation is the resurrection for this. Okay. And that, right. Uh, and so so a moment ago you said. Um, I haven't just proved that the resurrection was possible. I'm trying to prove that it's probable. You haven't proved that it's possible at all, and you can't make that next step. I mean, how can you can you can you present an argument to show me that that the resurrection of a, of a human being is possible? Okay, so so all right, let's all right, let's back off. So you see, this is what happens. You have to you have to you have to back up. All right. The only way you can the only way you can show that the supernatural is improbable to the degree that, or at least to the degree possible, then you would have to show, then you would have to 
show that God's existence is implausible or his intervention in the world implausible. And this was actually, I think, from reasonable faith. Yep, that, that, that's correct. So it's, it's absolutely correct that in order to, to, to prove that the supernatural is, is, uh, is false, you'd have to prove that whatever the source of the supernatural is, is also false. But I'm not trying to prove that. All right, so then we can at least establish that the supernatural is possible. No. And we have good historical evidence to suggest that a supernatural event has occurred. So we can't just say, oh, supernatural event. Like, when, once we have the possibility, that's not it. But And then we have historical evidence for the supernatural claim. Then we can establish a, philosoph- a philosophical and historical, um, at least to a degree, probabilistic. We can well, probabilistically say that it's most likely true, the, the, the given look, the given. It, of- it's it's very well it's very well put together. It's very very well rehearsed from 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 the from the basis of the idea that we have to accept that there's a supernatural element. But but you're beginning with and and you're still doing the same thing, which is you're saying that there's no good reason to think that the supernatural is impossible. None of us are claiming that. Not not a single one of us here is claiming that it is impossible for supernaturalism to be true. And so what we're admitting there, of course, is that it's possible. It's one of many options that that can account. For the, for the fact, if we're going to accept it, that the tomb is empty or that Houdini's ropes are by themselves and he's not there. Right. So one possibility is that he, he did it via, he escaped via supernatural means. It's possible that the supernatural did it. I'm just concerned and I'm just interested in what's more probable. We, we've essentially got a, a precisely analogous situation with Houdini because Houdini has, has done something which uh, to, to our modern eyes would seem like a magic trick. And we've got two explanations. It, it, it could have been supernatural or it could be naturalistic. There could be either of those explanations. And it's precisely the same thing with the empty tomb. There could be a natural explanation. There could be a supernatural explanation. You're the one coming and claiming that there's a supernatural explanation. We're not claiming, uh, we're not claiming either way. So we're not, we're not saying that the supernatural is impossible or even improbable. That, that's not a claim that we're making. Mm-hmm. So what I'm saying is, again, the burden of proof in some sense is actually since we've since we need to understand how the supernatural is impossible. Since no, again, must- I have to stop you. I've just I I just said three times we are not saying that the supernatural is impossible, and you said or impossible or, impo- or none, impossible. None of that. We're not saying any of that. And then you say, okay, in order to establish that that the supernatural is improbable. We haven't said that. We, we have not said anything about the supernatural being improbable or impossible. You're injecting that. And when you inject right. that... That's the thing, I understand. But all I'm, all I'm playing on is the fact that I would say that the supernatural is, to, to the degree, it's at least possible. We, so, we've admitted this clearly. It is possible. Right. So, so I did not. Is, okay. So yeah, I, 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 also, okay. I, I also wouldn't need to, to, to actually grant that, that claim at all. Okay, so it, just me. <laughs> it's, it's, it's all on you. No. you. You just have to show us that it is possible and or probable for the supernatural to exist. It's not on us to prove that it's not the case. And so, yeah. I, I'm saying yeah. that it's possible. I'm granting you that. I'm saying it's possible yeah. that the, the, the reason that that has happened has something to do with the supernatural. I think it's improbable. Why? Because we don't see the supernatural anywhere. But I can't rule it out because that's just not the way that knowledge works. So okay, well, call me well, super well, open-minded. We but We don't know that. There have been reported instances of various supernatural events, such as ghosts and stuff like that. We can't entirely yes, rule it out. Yes, but when we verify these things and we look into them, none of them turn out to be supernatural. None of them. So you're, you're supposing that there was a supernatural reason for something, and right. I have no examples of the supernatural Ever. Yeah, and do you, you do you trust that eyewitness testimony? Do you trust the eyewitness testimony of people who've seen UFOs? Okay, we need we need proper evidence that that somehow leads that that okay. leads. And we to, need proper evidence for your claim. And, I, and I'm giving you proper evidence, such as the empty tomb, and we need. No, it's not proper no, no. evidence. You're describing the fact. We need evidence for your claim. Your claim is different from the fact. Yeah, the fact the is f- the empty tomb. The claim is the is is why the empty tomb is empty. Or the fact okay. is the ropes that are left. The claim the is that he dematerialized and rematerialized in another point. Right. Do you want me to show? Do you want me to show the evidence for the um the uh the empty tomb? Again? Why we're here. But but I don't. You say again as if as if you already have. All, all you seem to have done is produced uh, a, the 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 one you've been pressing most is, is a philosophical case, which is that if the supernatural 
uh, is improbable, then that would mean the source of the supernatural must be improbable, which I'm not even sure is the case. The reason I entered into the philosophical is because um, we kind of got into the philosophical. You said, all right, let's back off for a second. Let's understand. You need to show the supernatural. You need to show the supernatural. And that got into a philosophical contextual background. So, Well, you do we need, need to. to you do need to show the supernatural is probable or possible. Right. So now, so now we're getting. So now let's get into this. So now let's get into the historical. So one thing is, um, Justin Martyr wrote and said by Trey for the Jew, chapter one hundred eight, and he said, "Well, the disciples stole him by night," which means that 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 means that it basically implies the empty tomb. So, so since we can, so how do you deal with that? De- deal with what? The, the fact that a skeptical the skeptical source Justin Martyr is, who wrote and said by Trifo, the Jude chapter one oh eight that the disciples if if you want I can read it to you how, I, how do I, you I deal with the fact don't. that there's there's people that earnestly write in the Quran uh, that um, Muhammad flew to the moon on a winged horse how do you deal with the fact that there are ropes on the ground after Houdini's escape yeah. that's not what we're interested in we're interested in why this thing occurred. And how it, and how it occurred. Well. Separate explanation. If, does does Muhammad's keys flying to the moon have his proper historical evidence? Does Houdini's so called um, like if we were to have a conspiracy theory about Houdini? Houdini I have has, video of Houdini escaping from things. So first right, of all, you're, you're right. citing Justin Martyr, who was born even another seventy year, fifty years after Tacitus. Right. The, so, we we will grant you an empty tomb, even. The born. issue is what is the explanation for the empty tomb? That's all that we were addressing. Right. So can you come up? So can you come up with a more probabilistic explanation of the empty tomb than the resurrection? Uh, yes. Like, give me an example. Aliens from another planet with natural technology that could beam him out is almost definitionally more probable than the supernatural. But I will retract all of that so that we don't go down that road and say, no, we can't give you a more probable explanation, but you haven't demonstrated that you have even a probable explanation. I, I won't go that far. If, but just, just being straight, I just, I just can't go that far. Yeah, me neither. You're asking me to say it's more probable that a supernatural event occurred than many, many, many different natural events. I, ca- I just cannot get that far. And I, I, it, I'm- the, o- the only reason I go that far is because mm. our absence of an explanation for the empty tomb tells us nothing about whether your proposed explanation is likely, probable, plausible, or true. Right, so... So, all right, again, so with the supernatural, we just, we, you have to show why it is impossible. No, we don't. I, 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 don't, think, I don't think we're getting uh, anywhere here. We are um, yeah. we're I, going in circles. I appreciate I really the do. time, but we're yeah. getting nowhere. Um, yeah. Maybe, right, maybe yeah, yeah. it was yeah. a pleasure speaking with you. Maybe, maybe listen back to this and see what you can, you can ascertain out f- uh, from it. Definitely. Uh, thank you for the sign. I was a little nervous. Sorry. No, no, you, you, you didn't sound you, nervous at all. It's absolutely fine. It's thank just, you for it's your just time. yeah, th- th- there's a frustrating thing of going in a circle with the same thing every time. Of course. You need to show that the supernatural isn't possible. No, we don't. Yeah. Just like I don't need to show that it's impossible for Houdini to dematerialize. Uh, I don't, I actually think that both impossibility and possibility need a demonstration. That you, you would need to demonstrate something is possible, something isn't. Mm. There's a difference between philosophical possibility and epistemic possibility. And so the fact that we can't show something is impossible doesn't mean it is possible. But on a philosophical level, we could say, okay, here's possible explanations. And they can be as ridiculous as we want. Oh, uh, uh, God did it. A, you know, Pixies did it. Uh, there's some you know, magical stone in a gauntlet that lets you do those sorts of things. The problem is, is that even after listening to those, what we really are looking for is let's make a list of plausible candidate explanations and then try to figure out which one's most plausible. And even then, we're not making a proclamation that, that the explanation is true or that it is reasonable to accept that it's true. Because yep. the right explanation, you just may not have evidence for. Yep, it's a simple issue of burden of proof. And we were just, we were just going around in circles, uh, and it's a yeah. shame. Uh, it's okay. So we've, we've hit the 6 o'clock time, but thankfully, our producers have said we can run over and we're not taking any more calls, but there are four in the queue and we can clear out the queue and do those. So we'll try and hit those in a, in a reasonable process here. All right. Um, let's go to Jeff in California about religious freedom bills. Thanks for waiting. Oh, thank you. Okay, yeah. Um, 
wanted to address a prior show that she had called Re- Religion, Freedom Bills in Texas. And it was actually Don, I believe, yeah. that I'm quoting from. He said, um, <clears throat> religious beliefs are evil, and there's evil stuff in the Bible. And I'm kind of thinking that probably you agreed with him, right? Like well, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't make a blanket statement that religious beliefs are evil, uh, but I would certainly agree that there are evil things in the Bible. Yeah, so would I. Okay. But not everything in the Bible, Bible should be banned. Sorry, the Bible should that? be banned. No, no, no. Yeah. Why not? I don't think anything should be banned. Uh, it, it's in <laughs> careful books. There. Yeah, I'll be careful. <laughs> but I don't think you should ban any well, book. You shouldn't ban the Quran. There's, there's, the Quran is for very <laughs> horrible stuff. It, it shouldn't be banned. The fact that a book has um, a mind camp, uh, objectionable you know. instructions in it, isn't a reason to ban it. That's a reason. It's a teaching uh, opportunity to show people the Bible. Uh, Sorry. Oh, so, yeah, it doesn't. Isn't the Bible responsible for the things that you address, like with the no people um, teaching you know, that are going on? In- no, the Bible's not responsible for anything. It's a book. People teaching that the Bible is the word of God that people need to obey. They bear some responsibility uh-huh. for spreading those bad ideas. I can use the Bible as an example of what not to believe and actually do good with it. Also, the something being the cause or motivation of, of an action is not enough to make it uh, to make it responsible for it. So, for instance, if I read uh, the God Delusion by Richard Dawkins, and for some reason I decide to to, to based on that, I, I misinterpret Dawkins to think that he just hates religious people, and I go and murder a religious person. We're not going to ban the God Delusion, and we're not going to hold Richard Dawkins accountable because, although it is the case that it's the book that made me go and do that, it's not the book's fault; it's my fault. Yeah. Okay, so now do you think that uh, Don was out of line by saying religious beliefs are evil and evil? There's evil stuff in the Bible, or, or at least I think I think they're two different free. statements. It, if he was making a blanket statement that Im, that implied that all religious right. beliefs are evil, then I think Don was mistaken. But I know Don well enough to know that that's not his intent, and if that's what was taken from it, um, then th- that should be corrected. But I think it's also fair to say that there are religious beliefs that encourage people to do evil and that the Bible has evil things in it, um, and that's fair. Uh, okay. I'm curious, do you think well, the Bible why, has why evil things yeah. in it? What's that? Perhaps it's a side point, but do you believe that the Bible has evil things in it? No. You don't? No. What about slavery? Uh, so, I take it you accept, uh, uh, you well, know what, slavery? Well, chattel slavery, a new world, yes. Um, Chattel slavery is, is evil, yeah. Well, what the, what the Bible, the Bible was, what the Bible describes in Exodus twenty one, would you be my slave based on what the Bible says? That I can beat you as long as yeah, you don't die would, within if, a couple if I days. Had, um, if I, if we were living in in Israel or in the, uh, what what difference does it make where we're Exodus? living? Yeah, that's well, because that. Yeah, what what, what is. Um, yeah, you, you'd be all right. You'd, you'd, you'd be you'd be all right living. You'd be all right doing so if you live in Israel, because the Bible quite explicitly treats slaves that are from Israel different from non-Israelite slaves. It makes an so, exception for Jews. Well, yeah, precisely. So, so it says. Not, not it, it, that, it says if I, in in, if I, uh, in the book of Exodus, your slaves may come from the nations around you. From them, you may buy slaves, but you must not rule over your fellow Israelites and that, ruthlessly. And that you can beat them as long as they don't die within a couple of days. Yeah, and then that's only talking about the Israelite slaves that you can beat them as long as they don't well, die that's within, both. within a couple of that's days. That's both. When 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 you when you move to uh, talking about foreign slaves, such as in Numbers thirty one, uh, you're talking about explicit sexual slavery. It's something that is just completely morally indefensible. Well, uh, you're, you're kind of jumping ahead because the the slavery with the Israelites was voluntary servitude. Okay, so are you against that? So so you first of all, so first of all, do you, the, the, what we're, we're talking about here is that there are two different rules for how to treat Jewish slaves versus how to treat the heathen slaves that you buy from people around you. So that's already a position that is that is the antithesis of equality, right? And then it, mm-hmm. then it, in Exodus 21, it also tells you how to trick your Jewish slaves so that they become your property forever. So in the same one that make, in the same, the same passage that creates an exemption or an exception for Jewish slaves, it also tells you the loophole of how to get around that. So... If you're okay with what the Bible has to say about slavery, then would you be my slave based on what Exodus 21 says? Well, no, because uh, if I was, if I committed a crime and I had an option of going to prison or working community service, I would choose community service. Right, sure. okay. But I don't know how that's wrong. But, but look, e- even, even if uh, the slavery in the Bible is this kind of voluntary servitude that you're talking about, 
imagine if if it's like an, an employer employee situation something like that whatever you want to think of it imagine a situation in which your employer was allowed to beat you and beat you in such a way that he wouldn't be punished unless you die, die as a quote direct result is that okay is that in any way permissible even if it's voluntary servitude which by the way it's not but even if it were i don't think that this would be morally permissible were you aware that uh, the, the penalty for killing a slave was death yeah, but we, if they beat no, the slave, he was the he did yeah, 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 but this, this is the thing, right? If you kill, if you kill the slave, then you're punished for it. But uh, if you beat the slave mercilessly and, and and leave it on the ground to 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 suffer and in agony for three days, but the slave gets up after a few days and doesn't die, then no punishment whatsoever. None, zero, zero. That's well, what I, the I creator think of the universe I, I think thinks thinking moral. Of, along the lines of the law, where like let's say seven years, you that uh, seven you years know, only applies to Jewish slaves. Yep. But I'm not talking about a, current, a more current law where you, if you avoid the. Uh, why would you talk <clears throat> about why would you talk about current laws when we're asking you about what the Bible says in Exodus 21 and what your views are? Okay, well, why do you think um, in that passage you're talking about about, about beating the slave? Why do you think? Um, <clears throat> why did, why don't they give like an exact time? Like, uh, why why do you think they say one or two days? Because they were ignorant savages. No, no, they they don't they don't even they don't say one or two days. <laughs> they don't say one or two days. They just say that the slave master will only be punished. So it says that that the the master can beat the slave with a rod. It specifies a rod, uh, and it says uh, that he will only be punished if they die as a direct uh, as a direct result. So what that means right. is so that they're, if they're you trying to establish whether or not he actually killed the slave, what that means is that if you beat your slave with a rod, you won't be punished for it unless they die. So, so it, it, in this scenario, you, you can break all their bones. You can no. you can if, ruin if them. They found the, uh, but if they don't they die, the rod, it's fine. And they they found the rod. And they found like uh, blood stains or his hair. Uh, then they would then they would have punished him. No, only no. if he died. Only Exodus twenty one verses twenty and twenty one. If a man beats his yeah. male or female slave with a rod and the slave dies as a direct result, he must be punished. But he is not to be punished if the slave gets up after a day or two, since the slave is his property. And you are advocating that a position where someone, a human being, can be viewed as someone else's property, which can be beaten as long as they're not beaten to death, and you are claiming that you're okay with that. Well, they're not. It's not okay to beat a slave. It, it says it's strange. Well, God says that it is. Oppressed. Yeah, you, no, I mean, you disagree with God. Oppressed. I mean, I, I just, leave. I just read the verse to you. Well, so if I beat my slave, and and oh. it does, and the slave does not die within a couple of days, no punishment shall come to me. Okay, well, which is one or two days? No. Which one? Let's say uh, it says a, a day, day or two. Here's, here's Why the does it matter whether it's twenty four hours or thirty six hours? Well, five minutes. If it's okay for me to fucking beat someone as long as they don't die and I'm not to be punished, then basically slaves are on another tier, and it lists them as property. Yes. And you're trying to make excuses yeah. for this because you're unwilling to admit that there's something that the Bible advocates, which it should not. Why are you okay with owning people as property? Is it ever moral to consider a human being yeah. as somebody right. else's property? Military, military members military. aren't property. I was in the military for eight and a half years. We're not property. Not property? Correct. And even if you're property, you, you can't. You're property. No, first of all, it was voluntary service, and you have yeah. to obey certain rules, but oh, I'm not okay. property, just like children aren't property. Parents are stewards of the children. I still had rights while I was in the military, and I still had avenues to do things. And if a superior officer had, yeah, you do. What about, if, his, what about if a superior officer had beaten me, it doesn't matter whether I died ever; they would have been punished. Yeah, you're so comparing they, apples and oranges. Did. This is the tap dance that people do when when they are so infused in a religious belief that they will not acknowledge the simple fact. The simple, obvious thing, that they have accepted something that is immoral, and so they want to do a bunch of hand-waving. Well, you you know, if you're in the military, you're property. No, you're not. Every one of your analogies what is going to fail. What about when you're in prison? If you're in prison yeah. and a prison, guard beats property? you, and whether you die or not, the guard can get punished. I, did, I didn't ask whether. I'm talking about being property. Is a you're not property. You are a ward of the state. The state has an obligation to take care of you, and prisoners still have certain rights. 
So you, you, you're not property. But, but, but what you're engaged in is still whataboutism. Instead of pointing to the other yeah. things that you might think are objectionable, explain why you're not objecting to the thing that is explicitly objectionable in your book. You have a right to do whatever you want over your own property. And so if people are property, then you can do whatever the, whatever you want to them. Let me just break this down to facts, because I'm, I'm still, maybe I'm slightly behind, but you have this scenario where one person owns another person. He then punishes that person for whether it's right or wrong, it doesn't matter, but in this case, I should say. That person is punished in the sense that the tormentor breaks every one of their bones, cuts them, basically flays them, does all of these horrific, nasty things. According to, to the edict, to the rules that was just read by Matt, God, the creator of the universe, moral authority, would not punish the person for doing that if that person survived. And, and there's one addendum I have to put in, I'm sorry to stomp on this, because it also expes, says in the same passage that based on what harm you do, like if you, if you poke out a slave's eye, you have to let them go. So it's no longer an eye for an eye when it comes to slaves. If you poke out their eye, you have to let them go, but there's still no punishment for poking out their eye. So, so in the scenario that I gave, the eyes are intact. You just happen to flay and break all the bones. Well, the, That's it okay. The no really punishment. Into, it, it doesn't get into all the punishments. It, it's not that they're not punishment. They're not going to be put to death. It's, it says there, words, there will they, be no if punishment. If a slave... It's, it literally says there will be no punishment. Should, 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 should a person be punished, uh, whether or not the person is a, an employee, whether the person is in voluntary servitude, whether they've abducted and enslaved the person, regardless of the situation... Should somebody be punished if they mercilessly beat another person with a rod? Not even, not even mercilessly, just yeah. punch them in the face. Well, yeah, the, the scenario it probably is a, is a slave that has uh, done something like me. Yeah, I'm tired of you making excuses. If the Bible was meant to give um, the Jews an opportunity to, to beat their slaves at, at will. The cognitive Why bias say there is... Like, well, if a, if, a slave is, if, if a slave is abused, they can not only leave, someone has to take care of them. You know, I don't think we're going to get anywhere here. The backflips that you're doing is quite frustrating, if I'm honest. It's yeah, you either example, don't know what your book says or you don't... Yeah, it's an example of how religion can poison well, otherwise but you decent can't, minds. But you can't look at the book with a modern with modern lenses. Okay, you, you then let's that. look at... Let's, let's, no, stop, stop. Let's look at it with an antique lens. Was it ever okay to own a person as property and beat them as long as they didn't die? No. Mm -hmm. Then why does the Bible at that time say that it was? It, it, was not, uh, it was not permissible to beat a slave to death. The That's fuck it wasn't. I just read it to you, and you wanted me to look at That's it with that you, lens. Yeah, but you're, you, have to, you have to get into the history of what was going on back then. I'm not convinced you know yeah. the history, but I just we just had this discussion, and I asked you, was it ever okay? So history is no longer relevant. Yeah. The fact no, is, you acknowledged okay. that it was never okay, the Bible right. says something that is the opposite of what you say. Why don't you agree with your Bible? I agree with the Bible. It, it does not get into the specifics about what happens if, it, a, if it, a slave is... It very clearly states it there will be no that punishment. It doesn't mean that they're not going to get punished. No, it, it does. It, does. it, very, it says literally it will, there will be no punishment. But give he is not to be how punished. Know, how do you know if, there's not going to be any punishment? Oh, my God. We're it just, says we're it done. right then. <laughs> Look, no. No, 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 sorry. No, I'm not doing tap dances on this slavery bullshit. There's a video up there. This is what religious ideas end up doing to people's brains. It's so sad. I, I, it, it really is sad. But to go back to the point that he was trying to express and how we got down that rabbit hole, and man, that's frustrating and sad. Um, what I'd like to say is, despite the fact that I think the Bible has evil in it, mm -hmm. even if he was to say he doesn't, Okay, I still don't want to ban it. Yeah, just about to. I don't care. I, I, you, you can have it. I don't want to ban Hitler's books. I don't want to ban nasty things. I think there should be an environment where you can actually look at these things. They need to all be accessible. I'm pretty sure, because I've seen this done before, that if you were to present this passage to him as if it were in the Quran, <laughs> he would absolutely agree that the Quran is advocating for something evil. Mm -hmm. But even if even if we go as charitably as possible then he's convinced that an all-wise, all-moral God inspired a book that sloppily yeah. suggests 
that you can beat people as long as they don't die. Exactly. You the best excuse you can come up with is this passage that was written by men managed to get God's views wrong. And then the next question is, why the hell hasn't God corrected it? Mm. And this is Old Testament. So when Jesus came along, you would think one of the first things Jesus would do is you say, that stuff that you guys wrote in Exodus about slavery, you got it all wrong and or, here's or the right just thing. The way that you're enacting upon it and the way that you're interpreting yeah. it is, is wrong and here's how you should be doing it. He could, it, he could even have said, you know where I said or where, yeah, where the author said yeah. that you won't be punished? Turns out you were a bit. You should be. Just a bit. Yeah. <laughs> and, and instead what you get is Paul, who, who is the true founder of yeah. Christianity, saying to slaves, obey your masters, even the cruel ones. Yes. And my position has always been the only advice you should ever give slaves is do everything in your power to escape and to free as many people along with you as you can. It's conversations like that that really illustrate to me what Hitchens was saying when he said that religion poisons everything because very smart, decent person. And I'm so sorry to see that it's got a grip on you like and, that. And the nice thing is he's probably a great guy would never actually own a slave, would probably never beat a slave. He's not trying to make excuses for that. He's just stuck in a position where he, part of his mind accepts that there's a problem in his holy book and another part won't let him acknowledge that there's a problem in it. Yeah. And if we, if he, if we just find a way to get over that hurdle, um, which we're running out of time for, and we've got three more calls to get to. Anybody got a preference for where we go next? Uh, I, mean, may, I mean, Eric might be fun or, or, or the... Or the one underneath, perhaps. I don't know. Stephen, what do you think? I'm cool with Eva. All right. Eric in Utah, you are on with Matt, Alex, and Stephen. Hey, it's really nice to meet you guys. Uh, so, Matt, I understand that you uh, are on the position uh, that uh, objective morality exists. Am I understanding that right? Uh, in the sense that we can make objective evaluations once we have a goal, the goal may ultimately be subjective. Okay. Uh, that's a good explanation. And um, Cosmic Skeptic, I understand that you, or at least the last video I watched of you talking about this, I understand that you do not agree with this position. You uh, you believe in sub subjective morality, is no, that right? No, I completely agree with what Matt just said, that the basis, the baseline of morality is a subjective preference, but there are objective derivatives that we can uh, get from uh, that subjective goal. Oh, okay, okay, that, that clears it up. I guess there was just a misunderstanding of your views. Yeah, that, that's, uh, so, by, by the way, I just want to say that's probably uh, my fault. I've been, I've been talking a lot about morality and, and my views have been shifting and changing. Uh, it's, it's fairly solidified now, but I can see why people will have misinterpreted what I said in the past. I previously... Actually, I think it's my fault. Having spoken about morality so much... I think I, it's my fault. I advocated for it being objective <laughs> and had not been clear that the foundation of let's call it well-being for the, just the sake of what I've talked about, whether or not one cares about well-being is ultimately subjective right. and how and why we should care about well-being is ultimately subjective. I was definitely not clear of that early on. I've, be, I've gotten more clear. Yeah, th this is the disagreement that, that Steve and I essentially had uh, on YouTube. Um, look, I... I when I call myself a moral subjectivist, and this is where you'll get that, that impression from, moral subjectivism to some people means that if you say murder's wrong and I say it's right, that's just an opinion, and the subjective uh, the subjectivity is lying at the level of the action. Well, I don't think that the subjectivity lies at the level of the action. I think it lies at the level of the preference to, it for, uh, to which the action is trying to, to, to achieve. So whether or not murder is, is right or wrong can be an objective derivative of the subjective desire for pleasure, but the desire for pleasure itself is subjective, if you see what I'm saying. And it's worth clarifying that moral subjectivist is distinct from moral relativist, which moral relativism is generally viewed as each individual culture defines what morality is. And I don't know that any of us would agree with no, that. I think we, we adamantly disagree because although the, base, the baseline is, is subjective, the baseline for well-being and pleasure is subjective, it's a universal subjective. And a universal subjective is distinct from an objective, uh, but the fact that it's universally subjective means that regardless of the culture, the objective derivatives that we can get from that subjective desire are going to be the same. Clear as mud? <laughs> yeah, about... Uh, so, all right, so, so my understanding is that you are not proponents of subject of uh, um, moral relativism, but rather moral subjectivism. Is that right? Did I understand that right? Correct. Depending on what you're calling moral subjectivism, we have to be careful. I'm going. I'm going with Alex's definition so that I can say correct. <laughs> All right, and, and and so I guess I'm a little confused that uh, 
my my understanding was that you were a moral objectivist, Matt. Is it? And now and now I'm hearing more subjectivist. I I'm, I just must not be understanding something. So the the example that I used, even at the beginning when I was talking about this. Um, was, for example, a chess game. The rules of chess are arbitrary. We've changed them over the years. But analyzing a position is objective with respect to the rules. We can identify positions that are better and worse. We may not always be able to identify which position or which move might be the best move. And in some cases, we may not know enough to determine whether or not a move is better or worse. But there are situations when we do, and those assessments of a particular position and potential move with respect to the goal of not losing the game, that assessment is objective. Okay, so if I understand this right, so once we've established a goal, then we can objectively uh, determine what is the best way to achieve that goal. Precisely. But the goals might themselves might be subjective. Exactly, yes. And, and I would say that rather than saying goals, I'd say goal, because there's only one goal. Ultimately, it all breaks down, I think, to well-being. For the well-being of mankind. And I would it, say it, that's a fact about you. I know you haven't asked my for my opinion, but I would say it is a fact about you. You're, you are born not with a blank slate. Just as you're born with certain physical facts that are more tangible, such as limbs, you are born with certain facts, such as you don't want to be suffering, which means you already have the goal not to suffer. And there are right and wrong, objectively, verifiably, scientifically, right and wrong ways to achieve that. And, and I am at least somewhat, if not largely in agreement with that. It's like, yes, somebody could sit down at the chessboard and not give a damn about losing. They may knock pieces around, they may try to make illegal, but they're no longer playing the same game. Yeah. And so I think there are physical facts about the universe that we inhabit that dictate what is and is not in our best interest so that it's not just a matter of personal preference. There are people who don't want to live yeah, pra practical ethics is is saying how can I best protect my king in this next move. Uh, meta ethics is saying why the hell are we playing chess? Yeah, and they're two different questions. Uh, the important one when we're talking about objectivity and subjectivity is the meta ethical question, and it's it's important to ask why are we playing chess? But the fact of the matter is that on a practical level, we are all playing chess, and as long as we are all playing chess, uh, there are objectively better ways to play than others. I see. Yeah, that, that, that clears it up a lot. A lot better than mud, actually. And uh, um, the, the the guy in the middle, your name is Rationality Rules, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry I didn't ask for your appearance. This is no, no, no. the first time I met you. And I was I was really calling because of Cosmic Skeptic and Matt because I thought they had a little disagreement and I was expecting there to be a... Well, um, you benefited from the fact that he and I sat around and talked about this for a few hours the other yeah, day. Yeah, I was about to say... Um, okay. Yeah, we we I, could have we would have hashed that out here. But if if you're interested to hear, uh, Matt and I did have a conversation about meta ethics um, for for an extended period of time. That's going to be going on my podcast. If if you want to see that conversation, including animal rights and veganism including issues. So for all the people veganism. who've been waiting for that, I am going to enjoy that. It's going to be good. It's yeah. going to be heated. I'm not going to enjoy the comment section, but uh, <laughs> I'll enjoy I, the video. I, I'm glad. I'm thrilled that we did it. It'll it'll be up, and I'll also post a link to it from my Patreon as well. Uh, and what I would ask is that you actually, the people who care about this, who wanted the discussion to take place, mm. that you listen to it and think about what, what everything was said before you start hitting me with a bunch of questions because some of them may be answered. Some of them it may be obvious that I don't have an answer to, um, but it'll, it'll make future conversations on this a lot more efficient. Absolutely. Brilliant. The uh, last thing I'd say on that matter is that I can totally see why you got the assumption the cosmic skeptic here uh, his beliefs were subjective because at the beginning of our conversing, he was. So if you'd only seen that video, then you would have seen an awesome conflict here and I would have laid back and enjoyed the fire. <laughs> yeah, I was, that's that's what I was, was expecting was a little yeah. bit more fire. But hey, you know what? Sorry I, to I disappoint. It, that, that's just the ape in me. I think it's better that we all get along. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that, that's good. Is that uh, your goal, yeah? Yeah, that's well, I, I really appreciate the call and your, and your time, Eric. I'm glad we were able to clear some of that up. I've got two more calls to get to before they kick us off the air. So on that note, thank you for calling in. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Cheers. All right. Stephen, pick who's going first and who's going last. Ooh, what do we want to finish on then? Um, let's go for uh, T. David, which is New Jersey. David, New Jersey. Welcome to the show. Hello, gentlemen. Hello, gentlemen. Hi. Hello. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. You're a little quiet, but I can hear you. Can you hear me loud enough? Yes. yes. Well, I just want to say, appreciate this, this hour of listening to. I think the young gentleman did a very good job defending his position. 
uh, if he did it well enough, I think he uh, did a good job. Uh, I would like to talk about my own journey, my own experience. Uh, it's my uh, beginnings of contemplating if, does God exist or not starts in, I suppose, about junior high school. And I did not go to church. I had no church background, whatever. And my beliefs were, just opinion I mean, at the time, was that there, uh, all beliefs, religious beliefs are, are myth, including God's existence, the existence of Christ, that's all mythology, and that the, the world evolved, um, and when you die, you're dead. That was just my basic belief. Now, I had a father who well, was always drunk. My mom finally left him. And after about a year, my dad comes back, and uh, all of a sudden, we're going to church. And my dad said he'd become a Christian. So I'm entering the church, and I'm going, this is going to be interesting. Uh, here I am contemplating that maybe there is a God. I mean, uh, I, can I, I can say that I experience that my dad certainly did change. And so the question was, he said God helped him, um, and he stopped drinking. And so I'm faced with looking at, well, is that, is that even possible? Because I'm, I'm not, I don't have that belief. For, for the record, I, ha I have a similar experience with a grandfather who was a terrible alcoholic uh, until my mom uh, introduced him to Christianity and Jesus, and that's what he credits with no longer drinking alcohol. Well, I've, I've, liked, I've listened to a lot of the videos that you presented, Matt, and I, and I like you because you can be real hard and tough on the logic, which I think is good and is important. But you also have a soft side. You have a compassionate side. You also mentioned things about your life. Don't tell I, anybody. I think... <laughs> well, as you as you tell people, I can sense it, and I think others sense that as well. Uh, you're a compassionate man. You're not just a you know, you're not just a, a difficult, hard headed man. You have some compassion. I think that's evident. Thank you. Uh, so for me, it's also is I didn't grow up in a home that where there was a lot of love, and I am faced with the fact that all of a sudden now my dad started to show interest, and it's like oh, he's finally interested in me. Because for the most part, I wasn't beaten. I wasn't uh, uh, treated poorly. He just was never around. He wasn't there. Do you, do you think that, that he loved me? Was a question. Whatever it was about, whatever it was about uh, starting to attend church that that turned him into a better father. Do you think that that was more to do to do with the doctrines and the things being preached from the pulpit, or do you think that's got more to do with the? community that he suddenly became a part of and the fact that he was interacting with people who had a shared goal towards the betterment of mankind. I, I feel like that would be more likely the reason uh, why he changed his ways. And I can... Well, I, I, listen, I, I can... I, could, I, I remember talking to my friends who knew my dad mm -hmm. and they said, what happened to your dad? What's, we hear a lot of stuff and, and go, well, I said, well, what you've heard is true. And he goes, well, what, what made him change? And I said, I can't tell you. I don't know. And obviously, you're, you can mention any possible factor. But, the, but, but I'm not being faced with that. I'm, I'm talking about more about myself, because I can't explain absolutely everything that went through my dad's life or what led him to that. So I can tell you about my life and how I, what I was faced with. So well, I'm just... I, I'm, I'm, I'm... Said, I said to myself, I cannot... Uh, Say there's a God or not. I don't know. I can't say if there's a heaven or hell. I don't know that. Uh, but I'm now in a church where people believe this. And I remember sitting in the pew and I go, oh my God, these people believe that Jesus is actually a historical person. Let me ask, let me ask you this, this question real quick because uh, we are running short of time and I want to make sure we get to this. When Alex asked about whether, whether it was more likely to be the doctrine of the community, let's say that even if it was the doctrine... Um, I think we would all agree that if somebody is convinced that acting a certain way is what a God wants, that can fundamentally change somebody's life whether or not there's actually a God who wants that, right? Of course. So, so the fact that somebody's life changes because they were introduced to a particular religious ideology is still independent of whether or not the ideology is rooted in truth or the, a god or the supernatural. It's, it's like when I've talked about how, um, you know, 
getting getting a, a structure to life if you've been unstructured before, you can convince somebody to be good with a, a fairly compassionate lie. And the fact that I'm they be, gonna, the fact that they become a better person doesn't tell you whether or not the underlying belief is no, true. You're absolutely correct. And those thoughts ran through my mind as well. Perhaps I can offer a little bit more of an oblique way to look at this. Well, let me just say how I looked at it. Okay. Okay. I said, maybe there is a God. I don't know. How has this idea of God formed in human history? It's there. It's been there for a long time. So I'm saying to myself, how, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there is a God. It, it's possible. I just don't think maybe it's probable, maybe right? Jesus, maybe Jesus. Maybe Jesus was a historical person. At that point, I'm saying I don't know. So and this all stems from your 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 observations of your father changing profoundly by find, finding Christ, right? Now, well, that just, that unfortunately, means, your story. I was just going to say, your story isn't unique. It's really sad, and I'm sorry to hear about the suffering that, that you've you've had. And I hope things are better. But your story's not oh, new yeek because it doesn't matter where you go in the world. It, honestly, it doesn't matter where you go in the world. You'll find your story in the cultural context of other uh, religions. So you'll find someone that was an alcoholic and he found Buddha. He, found, he became a Buddhist, which doesn't believe in a god, yeah. and it changed him profoundly. Yeah. And then you could have his son yeah. saying the same as you yeah. and saying, well, maybe those beliefs are true. It's like, no, it, you, it, he found an ide- ideology. He found something that comforts him. So, okay. so the question right. then becomes, how did you get from, hey, it's a myth, yeah. to, hey, maybe there's something to it, to then being convinced? What ultimately convinced you yeah. that this stuff was yeah. true? Yes, studying. When I went to college, no, then I'm talking about events that happened in the 1960s. I'm 67 years old. Sure, you, studying. So I'm going back studying to, you know, what and what was the specific evidence? Because you might, well, you know, if, if I ask somebody what convinced you and they say investigating, that's not an answer. Yes, well, that's what I said. I said to myself, you know what? The thing is, there's there's other religions. Uh, there's there's all kinds of. Is it a created world? Is it an evolved world? You know, I'm just going to look at these from both perspectives. I'm going to see what the Christian world says. I'm going to read about what the opposite view is. But this, is, this, this was kind views. of my point. There's not two perspectives. That's a black and white fallacy. There's many perspectives. There's whoa, all whoa, the whoa, other interpretations whoa, whoa. with no, religions. No, wait. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Now you're, <laughs> you know automatically that if there's a view there is a God, then there's a view that there is no God. Yeah, but now, you, you've people. accepted a particular God is what Stephen's addressing. And, and no, even in a view where there is no God, he's already addressed that with, with the idea of Buddhism. All I'm, all I'm asking I mean, is, first, what I'm was it? You're not, you're not letting me get to why, are you? I just would we, like to, we, we, we'd like, that? we're running out of time. I'd like you to get to why without a full story. Well, I called you because I felt this was a place where you could dialogue and you just don't, try to solve things in a few minutes. No, you, you, you can dialogue. One, we're under the pressure of time, and so it means that we push a bit quicker. No, and I, two, no, to, know, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I, I, to repeat something that I we called, were saying earlier is that if we don't accept a premise, then we, it, it makes sense to interrupt. I, I called in an hour before the program. I, I, understand. I understand that. I'm just explaining that we're short on time and we're, we want yes, you to get... I do understand. I appreciate that. I do appreciate that. I'm just saying that it seems to me you, you set up the propositions. And I, in my studies, I set up three basic propositions. Why that, three? But let them go. Yeah, because you have to limit. You have to, if you're oh, going to sure, write something sure. and do something, you could add other well, things. Well, if you limit it to Which, God as the only proposition, then you're done, right? No, I didn't do that. Okay, but that's why Stephen was asking why three. Wait, I compared, I compared, I set up, three, and I studied, and I eventually set up, Three, three basic worldviews. There's others, but three, the three basic worldviews. Okay. A, a worldview would, to me, incorporate what is human origin, what is human destiny, and then how do we derive these different views, uh, atheistic versus pantheism, uh, or panentheism, if you like, uh, and in the theistic views, how do they uh, then differ from their sense of origin and destiny, and then how do you derive uh, human meaning, human morality, human freedom, free will, which you've discussed somewhat tonight. How do we look at that from these different perspectives? And how do we understand human thought, rationality? 
And trust me, gentlemen, pantheistic thought, Buddhist thought, is not like Christian thought. I, we're aware of that. We're asking, what is the evidence that convinced you? I don't need a history lesson on religions or, or anything like that. Well, first of all, not all views can be true. Sure. Right? I also don't need a logic 101. I'm asking for the evidence. We are the evidence of something. We are the evidence of, of, uh, of uh, the accidental, as I say, Bertrand Russell. I thought made it very clear. I like Bertrand Russell when I read his works. Um, and we are the accidental collocation or collection of atoms. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that we're even in the and, ballpark of evidence that would convince someone that there's a God, let alone a particular God. Well, as I said, you look at what, to me, you compare what, what people say about human morals, human meaning, from one perspective versus the others, and then you decide which one makes more sense. So, so if a particular group has statements about morals that you find particularly compelling, that means that the underlying cause or source that they claim is true? No, you, you know, you, you look through, you read, you read what the people who are uh, written and you decide what the cases that they make. There's no, 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 that, 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 David is a, that David is a methodology for assessing which morality you agree with or find compelling. It doesn't tell you anything at all about whether or not the source, or the claimed source for that morality is true and real. For example, I find secular humanistic views about morality to be vastly superior to anything I've heard from a religion. But they would, I would accept those even if they came from Buddhism, Christianity, whatever else. There's plenty of things within Christianity that I accept as good teaching. But that doesn't tell me whether or not there's a God that is relaying these teachings. So your methodology about evaluating moral claims is good for determining you, which it's good for determining it's good it's good for determining which moral claims you accept. It is not in any way a testimony to whether or not the the claim source of those moral claims is true. I'm going to give you an example of one area because you've already discussed it, so it, it, we don't have to go into it very at length. As you said, you know, uh, that based upon your worldview, uh, everything is, everything is uh, matter, everything is, there is no supernatural, there's only nature. Actually, none of us said that. Yeah, none of us even came close to any of that. We've expressed several times that we're in a position of basically agnosticism. And it's also not relevant to the epistemology that right. you're trying to use. right where you say, hey, I agree with this morality, therefore that God is the most likely one to exist. There are people who don't believe there's free will. Three of them yes, sitting right here. Nice to meet you. Exactly, <laughs> yes, yes. What does that have to do with what convinced you of God? I, I swear we're just running out of time. Well, I, said, I said that gives me, if somebody says there's no free will, then I, and yet we have an illusion of it, so that begs the question, well, do we have it or not? And if we say we don't, then I would favor a view that says we do. I don't care what I, you favor. Yeah, I don't favor it. Oh, no, I know you don't care what I favor, yeah, but, but I care what I favor. Yeah, okay. Well, of course and you do. So you might as well have just called in to say that you favor a model every, that includes God. Every, I, I said that the, be, the belief that everything is just nature, and there's that belief, it's called naturalism, and there is this belief... And that belief has led people to believe there is no free will. If you think any of the three of us needed a course on consistent. naturalism, I'm trying to get to what actual evidence convinced you that a God exists. Also, theology can just as easily get you there to, to no free will, I mean. Oh, well, yes, yes. Well, Calvinism. Yes, so so, so, so it, is, it is precisely irrelevant. Well, not relevant to you. No, it's not relevant to the conversation that we're having. See, there, are, there are many people who believe that is relevant. And you just say it's not relevant doesn't prove that it's not relevant. We right. can, it can demonstrate that it's not relevant. It's relevant for people to decide if there's such a thing as free will, if I'm making decisions on my own. Or if I'm it's not relevant anything. to whether or not that is compelling, whether it is sufficient. You have sufficient warrant to accept that a God exists. There are people who believe in free will, who believe in God, and those who don't believe in God. There are people who don't believe in free will and both believe in God, and equally people who don't believe in God. All four of those boxes are checked. So whether or not free will comes into the equation is irrelevant.
Yes, listen, one of the first things I studied in, in school too was uh, the, the theology, so Calvinism versus Arminianism. Well, but bear in mind, I mean, Calvinism isn't isn't exactly an, an anti free will view. It's just it's just the view that kind of our destiny and where we end up in heaven or hell is well, is determined. Exactly it's not like a deterministic. Uh, it's not deterministic in the same sense that uh, that that uh, we would say free will doesn't exist down to every single action. So it, it's not. It's actually not even the same thing that you're talking about there. Thirty seconds. Why do you believe there's a God? Because we are the evidence of a personal. We are personal beings who think rationally. Who well, and, and who think we actually have morals, and how is that possible? That uh, only become that we're a product of, be it uh, particles, atoms, or whatever you want to call it. How is that that those things are all impersonal, non-rational, non-thinking? Argument it's, from personal incredulity. It, it's it's also a, a um, it's an argument. It, it's it's a fallacy. Of, it's it, it's a it's a. Um, you know, I want to be like the young guy who said, please, you're interrupting me. But I just was a few minutes away. A well, we, we just spent a lot of time asking seconds. for evidence, and then you gave us a fallacy. I said, what, what I would definitely you know, suggest, I David. I said what people commonly do, what most people do, what you're not doing, what you're denying so many callers, is that it's presuppositional. I, how do you, you can't get from a... I'm not interested in presupposing language. God. I'm interested for evidence for God. You and, can and presuppose whatever you like. And the evidence that you've suggested is, is essentially a fallacy of composition, as I'm understanding it, which is to say that, yes, okay, so the things that we're made out of and the things that we come from are not themselves personal, but that doesn't mean that so... Um, uh, like one water molecule is yeah, wet. It, precisely, yes. No, all, what it's saying is it's... it's impossible to believe it does it's a contradiction to say impersonal atoms without moral okay. sense of morality plan purpose or whatever has produced its antithesis okay that's it's not, not that's, only not that, that's impossible. not what a contradiction is okay. uh, a contradiction is very very is very clearly logically oh, defined that is not oh, what a contradiction, is a contradiction is not, also that is precisely that is a fallacy of composition topic, listen topic, if if topic, if if it is if it is the case if it is the case that there can be uh, a body of water which is wet, which is made up entirely of molecules of water which are not individually wet, then it does not follow that uh, from the, the constitution, the things that uh, produce the constitution of a body having one quality means that the body itself has to have that quality. I can't hear you. You can't hear me. Um, I tell you what, we're, we're going to... I don't think you're hearing me anyway, to be honest, so... <laughs> we're we're going we're gonna to stop here because we're way over time. We've got one call to get to, and I've got another quick announcement, which is that once this show's over, they're going to be airing uh, an episode of Atheist Vanguard right after this. So just in case, uh, like, I don't know, lightning strikes or we get disconnected before we take this last call, I wanted to thank you both so much for being here. This is a pleasure. Thank you very absolutely much. been thank one you. of my all-time favorite episodes, but they're already clapping, and we have one caller to get to. Well, what a welcome for the cooler. And that is yeah. Nick in South Africa. I apologize for making you wait, but here you are. Have at it. Hi, Matt. How are you guys? We're, we're doing well. Well, thank you. Ah, oh, good, man. Um, Matt, uh, maybe you won't believe it, but uh, I'm a Christian, and I don't say that uh, because, okay, you don't know who I am. I've spoken to you on, on uh, in a few emails. But um, first of all, I don't hope you mind. Can I just give the Christians a, a message, please? Because I, I wanted to start totally different to what I, I, I am now, but just the way the Christians are presenting Christianity. May I just give them a message, please, if you don't mind? Okay. Oh, oh, well, if it's short. I'm just okay. I'm anticipating the no true Scotsman fallacy. Yeah. Okay. No, no. Um, first we'll of see. all. Okay. Um, if you can't, if, if you say the word, I believe, okay, you can't expect of other people to believe what you believe. If you cannot believe in something you haven't seen. So if you believe in a God, Matthew 5 is 8, those who appear of heart will see God. Okay, and I don't want to go there. I don't want to. Too late. To, to go. <laughs> no, no, no. It's like legitimately too late because, first of all, I can't expect people to believe what I believe as long as it's reasonable and we can make a case for it that I, we could expect that. Also, I don't have to see something to believe it. Do, do you think that? Do you think you must see something to believe it? Have you seen God? Have you seen gravity? 
Yeah, no, of course not. Right. But have you seen your you own can't... farts? <laughs> yeah, of course. You've seen them. Yeah, my Tell own. me more. I've seen my own. Yeah, have you seen farts? Because I, I assume you believe that people can fart. I assume you believe that there are farts, but you don't um, see them. Yes, okay. You're trying to be clever now. This is <laughs> rude, isn't it? No, he's not trying. He's actually very fucking clever. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, um, have you ever seen a spirit? No. No. Okay, so I can't prove to you that there is one, but I do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you've so, actually just so, so now we have two we have two things a fart and a yes. spirit <laughs> none of us have seen either and you're convinced that one is real or you're convinced that both are real and fart. we're convinced that one is real because we can smell them and see them on thermal ah, imaging you and can smell it. yeah exactly um, yes. so so why are you convinced that spirits are real well I can see them okay how do you okay, demonstrate so. that. How can we possibly no, no, test whether or not exactly, you've you've seen them? That's, that's something I can't prove to you. Is it, okay. okay. I understand you so, you may not be able to prove it to us, but isn't that a problem? Because if I claim to see something and I can't uh -huh. demonstrate this to anybody else, how can yes. anybody else ever be convinced? And worse than that, why should I be convinced that what I'm seeing is accurate? That is not the point, mate. Oh, it's it's the only is, point. No, I, I, I kid you I, not. I, I we lock people it. up for seeing things that other people can't see based on yes. an inability to demonstrate this. So if, if there's something that I think I'm experiencing or seeing and I mm -hmm. can't demonstrate it to anybody in any way, how can I ever be confident that this isn't just a problem with my brain where I'm in, 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 well, experiencing I'm a delusion? I'm not trying to convince you about it. Okay. Not, well, thanks for calling. Not, of, of course, no. But what I'm saying is when people call, okay? Okay, let me, let me give you an example. What, where I wanted to come from, okay? Where the Bible's concerned. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes. I know it's amazing where we haven't interrupted in so here. long, but we're still here. Yeah, we're here. <laughs> okay, I just want to, to mention something. All right, we um, assume that there is a spirit in a body, okay? Okay. As Christianity assumes, all right? Okay. And we say that when God comes in the clouds, he will take his elect on the clouds and they'll go somewhere into space. Okay. That's true, okay? But now, in the first place, when the spirit leaves the body, according to religion, okay, not according to you, according to religion. I'm um, actually, that's why I asked you, I just wanted to mention this to Christianity, all right? When you leave the body, you are spirit. You, 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 no material matter. We matter started with, matter. we started by imagining that, that there is a spirit. You need to yes. get to how we can. Okay. What, but, what's the no, point? No, I, I'm, I, what I'm saying is, according to religion, there is spirit. Okay. I'm according just, to some religions. Just, like, just, according to God. others, there's I'm not. Matt, I'm not arguing with you guys. I respect oh, yes, you I beg God. to differ. No, I, I really do. Okay. I just want to mention something to the people. I'm not. Right. I'm not interested in people calling to hear themselves talk or mention things to other people. If you're calling to actually make an argument or a case for something that you think we should believe, then we are interested. But if you're calling just to tell us what you believe and leave it hanging out there like a fart, we're not. <laughs> uh, okay. okay. But, but we can smell it. Say, you, uh, it the, the creation in the Bible, okay? According to Christianity, that's a physical creation, is it not? Which started 6,000 years ago. And according, according to some to versions of, of Christianity, or, or it's it's six to ten thousand years ago. So others view the timeline as metaphorical. But go ahead. Yes. Okay. And according to you, you judge them because it is literally impossible for that to happen. No. Right. Because I believe in evolution. N no. Well, I, it, it is impossible if we if we believe in evolution. 
uh, as it as as it's currently understood, yeah. because it requires a longer time scale than sure. ten thousand years. Yes, the, 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 the but that's not why. Is that the creation in the Bible is not a recording of the physical creation. Okay, and that is where the people go wrong. I, I'm okay. I, okay, so when when the authors of the Bible were writing, they thought, well, what's the best way to make sure that people see that we're not talking about a physical creation? I know we'll rely on the fact that one day they'll discover the the process of natural selection, and from that they'll realize that the Earth isn't ten thousand years, and from that they'll realize that because we've said that it's ten thousand years old, they shouldn't be taking it seriously. I think they could have done it a bit more succinctly. And by the way, even if it's God, okay. even if it's God, even if it's God encouraging people to write, God could have done it differently too. It was God inspired. How do you know? But okay. Well, so, what do you mean by inspired? Yeah. Let, let me was somebody okay. thinking about God and they let thought this is what they should let write down? Are you going to give me a chance? No. Bye. Okay. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Okay. I understand. I, you I, believe I've heard that. that somewhere before. I'm sure someone else has made yeah. that argument. Okay. So uh, don't be sarcastic, please. I just want to show you something no, that I, you might not have seen you, you're, you're stating it as fact. It's what you believe. I understand. Okay. I tell and, you what, and, I, I, I'm going to let you continue, but as a test, I'm not going to hang up on you. I'm going to wait and see which one of them does it. <laughs> uh, which button is it? It's <laughs> that red wrap button. Look, uh, go on, Nick. Okay. And God created, he, he separated the waters from the waters. And between the waters and the waters, yeah, totally can, can I just clarify? Are you are you are you telling us this is what the Bible says, or are you telling us this yes. is what happened? No, what I'm saying is, you people are take, including the Christians, are taking this literally, and it's not what the Bible says. These are have all spiritual meanings, okay? Because if it's if it's physical, the 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 heaven was for, uh, created under the clouds, if it's physical, because he said he separated the waters from the waters and he placed a firmament between the waters and the waters to separate the waters and he named the firmament heaven. And then, but from the first day, he said, let there be light. It couldn't be the first light because he only started, he created the light on the fourth day. Okay, look, there, the there, are, day, there are two I options here. Before, before, like, just there, this, I, I, look, I, I see what you're saying. You, I, see, I see the point that, that you're getting at and, and we're, we're just going to run out of time. Look, the, hang the on a second, Nick. There are, there are two options here. There are, there are two options. Either the reason why the Bible uh, has this inaccuracy is because it's actually supposed to be taken uh, spiritually, or it has this inaccuracy because it's inaccurate. And I, I don't see why there's any good reason to believe one more than the other. I personally believe it's inaccurate. <laughs> well, that's easy to say, because if you don't understand what was written in this book, Obviously, the entire Bible is a mess because if you take Revelation 1 where God says he'll come in the clouds and every eye shall see him, in 1 Corinthians uh, 17, he says uh, the kingdom of God comes not with observation. I mean, that's a total contradiction, but I can explain that. And that's exactly the same with Genesis 1. But you, you have your various ways of explaining it, right? Because you have your very well, your very specific interpretation, which doesn't line up with everyone else's, well, most people's interpretation. This is what I was getting at when I mentioned the no true Scotsman fallacy. Okay, but it's they're not real Christians. I am. You should listen to me. Okay, but he called it from the start. But but let us say, like William Lane Craig, even okay, can he explain that the sun, moon, and stars was placed inside the firmament under the clouds? Sounds like your issue is with your fellow Christians, because you're all making an, making an assumption yeah, look, that we're not. We we don't take the Bible literally. Um, we take the Bible on the interpretation of, of the person that we're discussing with, who believes it to be accurate. So, yep. if you don't interpret the Bible literally, if you interpret it spiritually, fine. We can have a conversation about that. There's no problem. Exactly. Like the, the the only people who who have the only the only place in which this is a problem with people taking the Bible literally are the Christians who do that. And, and as Steve says, I think that means that you have more of a problem with your fellow Christians than you do with us. Because I'm, I'm happy to engage with a discussion on this uh, with whatever interpretation you have. But don't try and tell us how we interpret the Bible. Okay. But what I'm saying... Thank you, I appreciate that. What I'm saying is that the Bible is a spiritual book. Jesus Christ was never a physical being. It's just a book to me. 
I don't care whether it's a spiritual book, a metaphorical yep. book, a literal book. All I care about is whatever message you think you've derived from the Bible, is it true? Is it reasonable to believe that it's true? That's it. Even if it's spiritual, even in a spiritual sense, does it make sense to, to take some kind of spiritual meaning from this book? Re regardless of how you're interpreting it, what we're interested in is what your interpretation is and whether or not it's justified. Well, it all depends on what it teaches. Is it talking to the spirit or is it talking to the flesh? I mean, if you, if, if you listen to the spiritual explanations of the Bible, the water they talk about is not physical water. It's spirit water. It's the word. And sure. Word. So let's go ahead and say that we'll accept your view that it's talking to the spirit. I have no evidence that there is a spirit. I don't think I am a spirit. I don't think I have a spirit. So why should I care what the Bible's saying? Well, Matt, if you if you really don't want to hear the truth, then okay. obviously no, 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 no. I, I, I tell you what, my friend, you go for it. <laughs> should we should we do it together? <sighs> no, that's I'm so fine. British that I just can't make myself do it. <laughs> Put your finger on top of mine. You're not Matt, Canadian. Matt. Push the fucking button. <laughs> Thanks for the cool note. Anyway, that's the atheist experience for this week. <laughs> I appreciate everybody tuning in and all the people who showed up at the building after Thanks. Faithless Forum and everything else. This was amazing. I want you guys to live here and do this all the time. But if not, come back and do it again. Absolutely. And maybe Absolutely. you'll get to sit here with Tracy and things will go better. Be great. It's been a dream come true for me. Thank you very, very much. We'll see you next Thank time. You there are the people in the booth back there that make all this stuff possible so that we can sit out here and talk and get glory. Uh, those people are amazing. And a special shout out to the call screener today who got us almost nothing but theist callers. Yeah. We greatly appreciate it. We love you all. Take care of each other. We'll see you later. Until next time, my fellow apes. <laughs>
better person? No, <laughs> of course not. Since you came no, to No, I don't think I'm a better person. No, okay. I, I, th I think I'm as the same person I always was, okay. except I have more, more and a different hope. That's all. A different what? A different hope. Hope, okay, yeah. so your hope would be in eternity? Of equality, yeah. Uh, eternity, uh, you, okay. If you're thinking of cartoonish mm -hmm. images of heaven, no, I don't believe that either. Okay. But you believe in the afterlife, immortality? I, I believe, in, it, I believe in, in meeting, being with God. Okay, if you've ever read Dante's Inferno? A little bit. Okay, so if you go all the way up, you read The Paradise, not a lot of people do, not a lot mm. of people read all three books. But if you read that book, and to behold God, all right, that's what it's about, okay? It's not about harps and angels and stuff like that. It's about seeing the ultimate, right? The it's ultimate. About the ultimate. What's, what is the ultimate? The ultimate reality. Wow, that's quite a story. Before wow. we uh, dissect this, I want to introduce our special guest, Phil Ferguson. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. Uh, just a quick little background on me. I've been an atheist activist for about 12, 14 years. Been on the board of the Secular Student Alliance, Atheist Alliance International, and recently, a couple years ago, I guess, was the treasurer for the Reason Rally 2016. I have my own little investment business, and there is a lot to unpack from that video. Mm -hmm. There's a lot going uh, on. Lot. The ultimate reality, it kind of sounds like um, Stargate or The Matrix, you know, <laughs> when you, you, you wake up and you realize that you're in a simulation and there's a, a whole nother level plane, yeah. a whole nother level, a better way of seeing yeah. the world, that that was yeah. pretty messed up. Yeah, let's start. Uh, I asked him and he said he had a personal crisis. And that's what kind of blew my mind, being a atheist. And then he had a personal crisis. And as he said, that his first impulse was to reach out to yeah. God. A lot of people in prison are reaching. Reaching for yeah. something. They can't well, find I, it in this I, world. I really would like to talk to him personally mm -hmm. after seeing that clip. What does he think an atheist is I, I'm not sure because if, if like you said that you and you were clearly shocked this you're trying not be shocked mm -hmm. but you're clearly shocked that if I say I'm an atheist and then I had a problem so I reached out to God wait wait I, I can't it doesn't make sense put that a little bow on that I can't I can't un, I, that doesn't make yeah. sense so that was weird to start with yeah but he said that I asked him it, is it because of your past yeah the reason he reached yeah. out he already knew like the yeah, prodigal yeah. son that's well, terrible and I, and I would you know, if someone tells me they're an atheist, I accept it. Unless they do something that g gives me reason to doubt what they just said. He gave me lots of reason to doubt yeah. that he was an atheist. Now, have there ever been atheists that became religious? Of course. Mm -hmm. But I would really have wished, you know, to, to dig into more of that. But, you know, we have the clip. Uh, there's plenty of other things to talk about in the clip that he actually did. So. We should have got his phone number for yeah. him. <laughs> had him on your show. <laughs> no, that yeah, yeah, been, yeah, maybe you could have brought him back. Yeah, you have him call in here. That, that uh, you, you watch the clip and then have them explain it again. But, um, yeah, the, the, there's more, more meaning. Yeah, that's what he said. Uh, he said, I find there's... Uh, more meaning here that I didn't find in the other way. In other words, I'm try I was trying to get him to explain to me, what do you mean by meaning? And he said, no, I find meaning in this life, but it's a better quality. Yeah. Everyone has meaning. I mean, you know, you, even if you're a believer, you're going to have your meaning, but it's going to be dictated to you. Yeah. Often. That, that, it's a little different. And, yeah. and it's one of those things that uh, if he thinks he has more meaning, maybe he does. Doesn't mean he's right, though. True. I mean, yeah. it's, it's like the old argument: the uh, the drunk is very happy, the drug addict is very happy, yeah. reaching for comfort, finding yeah. it often. And if they say, "Well, I'm high, I'm very happy," so you're saying I shouldn't be high? Yeah, that's actually what I'm saying yeah. because <laughs> uh, your perceived happiness might actually be happiness, but there's other complications and baggage that comes with it, just like with most, most, all, most. The vast majority of religions. Yeah. It's a different level. There's problems that come with yeah. that. The transcendent, right? The yeah. above and beyond that they say exist that brings them to that higher level. Uh, so do you hear this type of uh, dialogue with your activism, Phil? Oh, all, all the time. It, it's it's never ending. I, I'm just thinking about one conference that I went to many years ago. And I often go a day early and stay a day late if I can to a conference because – it's more quiet and there's fewer people and you can have deep, long conversations. And several of us were sitting in the bar and a, uh, a young lady, maybe 35, 38 years old, 
ended up sitting next to me at this bar that wasn't at the conference. It just happened to be a person doing their job traveling, and we started talking about religion. And at some point, she told me that she doesn't think that the Bible is the word of God, that she doesn't think that Jesus actually existed. And I said, wait, 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 you had said that you're a Christian. Yeah. And she's like, I am. And I'm like, not a real Christian. I'm, Levels. I'm, Different levels. I'm again having trouble. And it's one of those things that maybe she was spiritual, not religious. Mm -hmm. But she didn't want to lose the Christian moniker yeah. because in this country, if you're not a Christian, yeah. you could create problems for yourself and your job and your family. Uh, so she was free to question and have doubts, but she wasn't free in her own mind mm -hmm. to not use the Christian label. So mm -hmm. I found that fascinating, you know, and... Did this guy in the video at some point use the atheist label? And what did he, what would, what was his understanding of the word atheist? Yeah. Does that mean he's angry at God? He said he was an atheist for some time. We didn't really push him yeah, yeah. as to how many days or hours that was. Yeah, and you can only do so much on the street. But yeah, uh, you know, if I've had people tell me that I was an atheist for a while, I was angry at God. It's like, well, if you're angry at God. I don't think you fit my definition right, right. of atheist. I don't think you fit the denotative dictionary definition of atheist, yeah. but whatever. I think with this guy, we're dealing with someone who has an amalgamation of a lot of different beliefs. It's, he sounded a little new agey. He sounded a little bit like he was reading the, the Greek philosophers quite a bit, which there's nothing wrong with that. But it kind of was a mixture of a lot of different things. And then I, he talked about hope. He has hope. And, of course, we know if we know the Bible, he's talking about the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of God and so forth, that writings in the New Testament. Most Christians would say, now abide if those three things, faith, hope, and love. So I don't think this guy knows his Bible very well. Um, so his hope, and I asked him if it was more into eternity, like heaven. And then remember what he said. He said, it's not a cartoonist image of heaven. How and does he know, really? Because well, he read Dante. <laughs> yeah, that's that, what he... Yeah. That's yeah, what he we didn't about. get into it, that in this video, but he goes on to talk about Dante's Inferno and there's ah. a trilogy of books and, you know, he's trying to get to Dante's perfect vision and ultimate reality. And, and it's a, a fascinating thing. Uh, I, I don't know if we discussed this before the show, but I'm <clears throat> almost fluent in Italian. Hmm. Okay. Dante's Inferno was written in Italian. Now, when I say it was written in Italian, it was written in the version of Italian from like four or 500 years ago. Mm. And Dante's Inferno is intentionally designed to be an allegory to mock and pick fun at a lot of political and famous historical figures within Italy and around in a surrounding Mediterranean. They are featured. And, and put into uh, an image, a uh, fantasy that the author has. It's not like he was the first person to go... Okay, here's how heaven, hell, paradise, and everything really are, and I'm just going to put random characters in it. Yeah. It's a fucking work <laughs> of fiction. And so yeah. if his vision of heaven is from reading that book, cool, but he might as well read Harry Potter and have an understanding yeah. of the one who shall not be named from that book. It doesn't mean that it's any more real than anything else. Yeah. But, I wanted to, excuse me, I wanted to yeah. say to him, if your God was real, he wouldn't need you to argue and debate for his existence. He wouldn't need Dante's vision. He wouldn't need vision. any of that. Yeah. Just he wouldn't show need, me. Yeah. He could just come down and say, hey, here's the facts. So, so here's a weird case, and I almost never say this, that his uh, vision of Christianity is more distorted because he read a second book. <laughs> that, Why read another book? Yeah, yeah why read another book? Uh, but uh, it's fascinating what people hear and learn from the people around us. I, I often wonder if a seven-year-old figured out that Santa wasn't real, but everyone earnestly insisted that, that Santa was real for their entire life. They at some point go, I guess Santa is real and just not fight it because it's not worth the hassle. A lot so of times I see that with religion. So they'd all be Santanists? Satanist, yeah. Satanist. Instead of Satanist, Satanist, yeah. I would have loved to ask him and get into more detail about what his personal crisis was. We didn't, we, we didn't pick that scab. Yeah. And, uh, you know. So I should have. I should have. I should have been a little more patient well, with him. Well, maybe. It's always a, a question that uh, I had a, uh, a younger relative. I don't want to get into too many details. That uh, when a family member had passed away, this younger relative told me uh, that they are now an atheist because what kind of God would let this person die? Mm -hmm. And I said, no, that's not good enough. God lets everyone die. Yeah. There's no uh, immortal believers out there. 
Not that, not that I've heard or seen any. Yeah. So I, I said, being mad at God for killing somebody is not a, not really being an atheist. That, so I gave them some books to read, and then they thought about it and studied. And a couple of years later, they're like, "Yeah, I, this 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 doesn't hold water." But I didn't want them to say, like, "This guy maybe that might something have- something happened, and he's pissed yeah. off." And I have no idea. So I'm just making shit up. But uh, so was he. So you know, <laughs> at some point. He decides, I'm an atheist, doesn't think about it anymore, and then something happens, a personal problem, stress and anxiety, and he goes back to back. what he had before. Yeah. So that bad reason comfort. that bad reason for being an atheist possibly was uh, a, you well, know. Well, all of us, at least I am, I don't know about you two fine gentlemen, but I, I do things for bad reasons more often than I'd like. <sighs> And uh, probably the worst thing is road rage in the car. Uh oh. You know. Shall I pray yeah. for you, Phil? <laughs> yeah. You know, when <laughs> someone cuts you off or does something, there's that visceral response, and then I have to click yeah. in the rational brain to yeah. go, "This is not in my own best the interest." The amygdala, then bring yeah. it into the front so part of the brain. It, it's easy as as humans to do something for uh, uh, inadequately rational reason. Yeah. It happens because yeah. you you're a human. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's right. Yeah, we all have crises in our life. It's how we deal with them. It just, I guess, I, I get a little bit impatient, especially when I talk to people that were once, they said they were an atheist. Uh, and I'm assuming that if you're an atheist, and we know now it's true, not all a- atheists are really rational in a lot of different things either, right? 9-11. So, uh, what's that? <laughs> I didn't say 9-11. <laughs> 9-11. It yeah. wasn't, I didn't say that. <laughs> Conspiracy. Skepticism is a beautiful thing. And not believing could be taken to an extreme that you don't believe we landed on the moon. You, yeah. you don't believe the earth is round. You know, whatever. Should, should we, uh, whenever someone says they used to be an atheist, whenever they use that phrase, say, that's cool. I accept what you're telling me. You just, you don't want to, you're not calling them a liar. I accept what you're telling. Can you define the word atheist in context to what that meant to you at the time that you were an yeah. atheist. Right. Yeah. So you at least have an idea where... Well, the there's no is. organization that you, uh, you know, you take your test and send it in to the headmaster yeah. and he scores it and says, yes, you you have the scores to get into the atheist vanguard. So instead of American atheist, it's American former atheists. <laughs> that, that, what, what, is, what is that? I like club? that. Yeah. What, yeah. what do they stand for? Yeah. Yeah, it's... it's yeah, here's it's, a guy, and I was saying a minute ago how... Sometimes I get impatient with people that I, I consider. I mean, I just met the guy, but he's, I, I assume that he was a very intelligent man. He's he seemed smart like enough. a very nice guy. And how he had a crisis and he had to turn to something invisible and supernatural to help him through the crisis. Well, we know in reality, our reality hopefully is not too skewed. We know in reality we actually have ways to cope with problems and crises. It's, it's called counseling. It's called friends and family members uh, and so forth. Yes. Alcohol. I, there are some alcohol. Rec- recreational <laughs> There are ways to cope with yeah. it. And, and, but it proves that he went right back to what he was told, just like the parable in the Bible, the prodigal son. I think he did because it, it doesn't, you know, when you look at it this way, <clears throat> How harmful would it be for me to do heroin to escape my problems? Maybe how harmful, smoke some weed, whatever. But could there possibly be any harm in going back to God, David? Like, Mm. what could happen? Harm? Harm. To him personally, uh, it could, I could get into a lot of it, it might affect how he votes. Well, that's an important That affects one. all of us. <laughs> yeah. That belief, the, that's very important. Yeah. We were discussing that uh, earlier. Because the unfortunate thing is once you join that group, I mean, if, if, if the only thing that changed is I went from not believing in God to I believe in God, if that's the only thing, I have to find a new fucking hobby mm-hmm. because <laughs> I don't have a problem with anybody. But it's never just that. Right, right, it's, right. There's other things that go with it. Uh, women shouldn't do this. Men yeah. shouldn't do that. Uh, you can't be gay. Yeah. Um, you, you, uh, you, know, you have to go to church. You have to do this. Yeah. You ha- there's... Currently, there's, shit that goes with it. there's a lot of laws concerning what women can and can't do, and the harm comes when you need a medical procedure and you can't get it done because some guys decided, no, I need to tell you what you can do with your with your body. Yeah. Yeah. So the danger it comes right da- back down to. And there's I, a lot I've of dangers in my years, opinion. This is a major root. 
of a lot of the problems we have. Magical of thinking. This, this is one of them right here. And what is that? That's a Bible? This is called the Adult Book of Fairy Tales, Fables, Absurdities, and Atrocities. That's a long name for Bible. It is, yeah. It's very yeah, specific, though. It's yeah. very specific. I've had that on there for years. Don't I'm confuse it with there. a lot of other books. Yeah. But this one definitely. Adult well, if you adult adopt that magical thinking, you can get into a lot of trouble because you think reality is a way that it really isn't. Mm -hmm. I, I, for five years, I pretended to be a Missouri Synod Lutheran. Maybe a whole other segment for that. But okay. Uh, at, at, after I would no longer pretending, uh, friends of ours, son became... Uh, baptized, not baptized, confirmed, mm -hmm. and 13, 14 years old. Okay. And they invited us to go, and we're good friends, so we went to see his confirmation. And after it was over, one of the elders sat down with me in the uh, the lunchroom when we had cookies and red punch, and he says, Phil, I, I don't see you at church much anymore. And I said, well, that's because I'm an atheist, and I was pretending, sorry about that. And he says, I can prove to you that God is real. Oh, wow. Oh, I'd like to hear that. Oh, what a relief that would be. Yeah, that, or see it. That would fix a lot of things, <laughs> yeah. man. Just So go for it. And so he makes a flawed argument. I point out the flawed argument. He makes another flawed argument. I point out another flawed argument. We go back and forth for a few minutes. Someone else sits down at the table next to us. And they got their napkin with a couple cookies and their red punch. And they sit down. They're like, oh, what are Phil and Elder so-and-so saying? They sit down and they go, oh, shit. <laughs> It's about uh, to get real. I don't want to hear this. I don't want to be here, but I can't just get up and leave because that would be socially awkward. How long do I have to sit here? Yeah, no, that should do it. <laughs> and then they just get up without saying a word. And yeah. we went for maybe a total of 15, 20 minutes. And then he says, well, you know, it comes down to faith. Mm -hmm. And before that had <clears throat> stymied me, but this time by maybe some divine inspiration, I had a, a retort. <laughs> and I said, oh, don't give up now. You were doing so well. Yeah. He goes, I'm not giving up. And I go, yes, you are. Look, you're an adult. I'm an adult. You told me you had evidence. Mm -hmm. You provided me not evidence mm -hmm. for 15 minutes. And now you decided to change tactic and say it's all about faith. If it was all about faith, fucker, <laughs> you should have started with that. Yeah. But you didn't. You thought, you actually genuinely in your own head thought that you had evidence. Only after 15 minutes of putting out bullshit arguments and lies mm -hmm. did you realize you don't have evidence yeah. and you went to a totally different tact that if you thought that was sufficient, you would have led with it. Yeah. So you just gave up and he just stared at me and he goes, oh, I got to go. Yeah. The evidence for the existence of God is insufficient. If there were sufficient evidence, there would be no need for... Bingo, faith. Right. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. That's all they have. And you know that, that what is it, the things not seen and believed? The evidence yeah. for things not seen. Yeah, that, that is the most vacuous line. And when someone quotes it to me, I can't help but guffaw in their face. Uh, that's, not, that's not meaningful. That, if you think that's meaningful, yeah. I'm very concerned about your ability to process reality. But some, a, uh, some atheists, some Christians will concede and actually admit, I've had them through the years, I actually admit, I cannot demonstrate or manifest God in reality. It's all on faith. And they admit it. You know what? Radiation burns are the evidence for things unseen. Yes. Wind. Hey, we need to get real Wind. with this. Wind is things unseen. Yeah. And I, and I don't like... Anytime you can replace faith with the word confidence, one should do so mm -hmm. because it makes it much clearer what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Like someone will say, do you have faith that that chair will hold you? I have confidence. It's not real high because I'm kind of fat. So, <laughs> but I'm pretty confident that chair is going to hold me. Yeah. But I allow for the possibility that this time it won't. But, yeah. We know what a chair is. We've yeah. seen a chair. I've seen a man sit in a chair and we know. break it. That's the difference it of happens. trust faith and belief faith. We have trust faith, right? We know, like trust. The chair. I think you, actually, you guys actually use the word trust. I, I, that's good. And I, I like confidence a little bit better, confidence, but yeah. trust one. in confidence, yeah. yeah. One. Uh, that's a more better, more better, gooder. A gooder. Understood. -er, gooder ist. Understood and worded. So it, people uh, can re uh, understand what you mean, but faith is so shmermy mm -hmm. because it shifts and it morphs and it goes from confidence to to confidence without any support. So if you have faith, confidence without support, mm -hmm. how do you know what it is you have faith in? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the trickiness of it, mm -hmm. you know? You just have to believe before you can experience all the magic. You got to mm -hmm. believe before you can believe. Yeah, you got to believe before you can believe. 
And this guy, he was real wrapped up in it, man. And I feel sorry for whatever drove him from his logic and reason to clutch on so tightly to the fairy tales. But he did manage to read a few books of Dante, and he's feeling really good about it. Yeah. So, I don't know, man. What was his proof of a higher quality of meaning? Oh, he gave me a lot of stuff. Uh, He was talking about beholding God is what it's all about. It's about seeing the ultimate reality. Ultimate reality. Not like VR. Yeah. I never got a chance to get into that with him. Like, what What do you mean? What do you mean ultimate reality? You said, you are you visually seeing God? Are you in heaven with God? He wants to pursue it because there's a story he read that says it's going to be awesome. Yeah. And yeah. it's so awesome that this life right now pales in comparison and uh, you might not even give two shits about it because you really need to be focusing on that ultimate reality. I think at least in this case, I'm delighted that he wrote, he read the Divine Comedy instead of Atlas Shrugged. So there's one little bit of light there. But overall, he seemed like a really nice guy. He seemed, he nice. seemed like intelligent guy, nice guy. Just, again, he went right back to that child indoctrination, the first thing he knew. It's powerful. Powerful it is. stuff. It's, yep. it's hard stuff. Very, um, very comforting. There's it is story. very comforting. The atheist there. can't give you that level of comfort as a promise for the rest of your life. But we can, we can give you community, You know, we can give you empathy, acceptance. We're human beings, and we're going to come together to solve human problems. And that's really all we can do. Mm -hmm. And that's why we do it, man. We get out on the streets, get these stories, and we break it down. We do. And it's a lot of fun. And we hear the same arguments over and over again. Indeed. Same things. Because they really don't have any evidence, so they have to keep talking. It's all conjecture. So, well, we're going to wrap it up, Ben? Yes, sir. All right. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Well, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Atheist Vanguard. Have a good day.